Doesn't this get you in the right mood? <laughs> Kind of neat. It's the kind of thing I show my kids so that they they think that what us theorists do is cool. <laughs> okay, so we should get started. Uh, okay. You have an hour. All right, well, let's get really started. Now, uh, you think that if I switch this, it's going to work. Okay, so um, it's too bad James Brannock's not here because my first remarks were uh, inspired and intended for him, but they'll, I'll repeat them when he comes in to embarrass him. Uh, the, um, actually, I was thinking that uh, maybe the best way to think about this is, you, you, know the, um, you know the film The Graduate, right? And this guy takes this guy aside and says, I have only one word for you, plastics. Okay, well, I think of uh, Kevin Moriarty about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, sort of pulled me aside and said, I have one word for you, multigrid. And that's actually now relevant. So my one word here, which is really from James Brannick, who pulls me aside and says finite elements. And I kept telling him finite elements are not important for lattice gauge theory. They're stupid. We can't use them. They're really the wrong idea. And uh, then uh, I started working with uh, these uh, characters, George Fleming, that character over there, Herbert Neuberger. I'm trying to reformulate lattice gauge theory, which we haven't gotten to, uh, for uh, conformal field theories. And conformal field theories are interesting. I'll give you a little reason for that. But it turns out that the, st the natural way to reformulate a conformal field theory is not on a flat manifold r to the d, but it's in fact on a sphere across it. Then you have um, lattice spacings and log r and angles. Notice the really remarkable thing is now the lattice does not carry any dimensions. So if you're going to do something that doesn't have a dimension, you should put in a lattice whose lattice spacing doesn't have a dimension. But then the natural manifold is not flat. And uh, then if you try to uh, make uh, regular spheres, here, I do have one demo here. Wait a minute. This is the this is Plato's best sphere, right? My kid was getting this from the game shop. That's an icosahedron. Unfortunately, that's the most perfect spherical lattice you can make. You can't do better. So you end up with um, triangles, which are called simplices. And you need to do some simplicial geometry to try to make it spherical as possible. Uh, and then if you keep having Branick saying finite elements to you, uh, after a while you realize that um, uh, it's okay because there's an old paper by T.D. Lee and Christ and Fern Fernberg? Richard. Freeberg. And if you sort of dig into what they did on random lattices, you'll discover they were doing finite elements. And um, if that doesn't convince you that it's in okay to do finite elements, even if you're not applied mathematician, if you finally discover and look at Reggie Calculus, you know what Reggie Calculus is? How many know what Reggie Calculus is? How many people don't know? It was a way to put gravity, to put fields in a non-trivial gravity background. But a gravity is a, is, a, is a manifold which isn't flat. You discretize it, you end up with simplicities on a manifold. There the idea was to make the manifold fluctuate because that was the gravity. But your starting point is actually a triangulation or simplification of a manifold. Anyway, it turns out that if you look at the standard Reggie calculus approximation, it is also a finite element. So you can use it three different words now. It's either TD Lee et al., or it's Reggie calculus, or it's finite elements. And uh, it's really very beautiful 
geometry, a lot of things are known, a lot of things are unknown, and it gets you the feeling that you ought to really be able to do this correctly. So that's, um, that's where I'm going. I'll describe a little bit of finite elements maybe on the blackboard. Oh, hey, did you leave uh, James Brannick in a ditch? <laughs> All right. Okay, so anyway, um, I predict that it, there will be at least some niche where finite elements, uh, which of course we'll rename um, Reggie Calculus, um, will be used. So let me tell you uh, uh, where this came from. Uh, Radio quantization was actually introduced um, in this paper by um, Fubini Hansen and Jack Keefe because they accidentally, well, because they noticed that string theory was actually quantized in, 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 a, reg, in, a, in a radial gauge, in a radial form. And uh, they said, why not do it in higher dimensions? Cardi has discussed this and almost got to the edge of saying one might want to use it numerically but really nobody's ever tried to pull it off, maybe because they were wiser than we. But you see this is a field which sort of died before it even got born, right? Um, so what's the, uh, the idea? The idea, as I said, is to realize that uh, you have a, a flat uh, space. This is standard Euclidean space. You can, of course, write it in radial coordinates, right? I mean, it's just saying that you take a flat space and I can always, oops, I can always write this as r, and that as theta, and then with its higher spheres, more angles. That's nothing. That's just changing coordinates, right? What radial quantization says is that you can ignore this wild factor. Now, that is possible to do if the theory is conformal and make no mistake. If it's not, it's, it's, it's a mistake, okay? So... In a conformal theory, this wild factor has no uh, meaning whatsoever. So then you actually map to a new manifold, which is see a sphere of uniform radius, right? So it's, it's really a, like a cylinder. In two dimensions, it's literally a cylinder, right? It's log r and an angle. That's, of course, trivial. That's called finite temperature lattice gauge theory. <laughs> I mean, field theory. So in two dimensions, it's too easy. In three dimensions, it becomes more interesting. Now, um, the motivation, as I said, is that if we want to go to a conformal fixed point or even close to conformal, what's happening is the scales are diverging, right? This is actually standard critical phenomena. And if you have a lattice in log r, it is exponentially large in the normal sense. So you could say, wow, this is terrific because we can now keep exponentially large uh, things on the lattice. It all sounds very good. I would hope it would work. Um, and as I said, uh, why are we interested in conformal fixed points? Well, I think you probably, those people who are lattice gazers realize that there's a gr small group of us who are, not a small group, I'm sorry, there's a group of us that are <laughs> trying to look at field theories that might be applicable to Higgs physics if the Higgs is not elementary. They are often uh, close to conformal. Almost all models have that. So we would like to understand a conformal uh, fixed point, and there's two ways to do it. One is to try to walk up to the conformal fixed point, so-called walking theories. But another way to do it is to leap right over and look at the conformal field theory and then back off. This is what we, what we do with chiral symmetry. We take a zero mass limit for a pion. We have a beautiful theory, no mass scale. But then we lift it and we learn a lot about QCD. So the idea would be the same sort of strategy here, that you first try to find what a conformal fixed point looks like and then lift it and see if it's relevant. Uh, there's a large group here. I show this in order to show that uh, Yale is uh, a big thing. We have a large group that does this. Um, our, our, our collaboration is called LSD. Uh, we actually came up with a name. We were at BU. And I said, Tom will never allow us to use LSD. It's too radical. But obviously, he is a child of the 60s. And he loved it. <laughs> and therefore, LSD survives. And of course, means lattice star dynamics. OK. Now, let me, let me go. I'm, I'm going to go quickly through this motivation. And then I'm going to start doing some finite elements, which I think is the sort of algorithmic style. But I want to tell you that you know, it's not totally unmotivated. OK? Now, OK. In higher dimensions, there's a conformal group. And so what are, what are we doing? When we put a theory on R3, we, of course, um, butcher the Poincaré group. But we do have discrete translations in three directions and a terrible uh, 
approximation to almost everything else. But the idea is that we will get back Lorentz symmetry as we take the lattice spacing uh, to zero, right? That's what we all hope. If you put things, uh, the, the um, conformal group is bigger. It's got dilatations and special conformal transformations. If you put it on a cylinder, you've got a discrete version of dilatation, sliding the cylinder on. So you're going to get sort of an obvious refinement and get dilatations to come out, but it's going to be very obscure that you get the rest of the Poincaré group. But we're no worse off. In the other case, it was obscure that we got the conformal group out, right? So what we're, hand we're doing is handling dilatations carefully and having to get the continuum limit to get the rest of the uh, conformal group. So it, it's just standing at it on its head. Uh, if you want to think about what it means for a propagator, a propagator in a conformal field theory is simply a power with a funny power called the dimension. And when you go to radial coordinates, this is really the, uh, all of this stuff is very simple. You don't have to get fancy about it, although um, uh, you can if you want. Uh, so you take a correlator and you go to, as I said, radial coordinates. This is doing nothing. What you do is you pull out these extra factors of R here. That's the rescaling, the while rescaling of what the fields mean. Once you do that, then you see that it's exponential in the log, and you see what used to be called energies are actually dimensions. By the way, all conformal field theorists call them energy, just to make sure that you don't understand what they're saying. So you talk to conformal field theorists, they say energy, they mean dimension. <laughs> okay. Um, and so on. Uh, so, you see, now what we're doing is we are measuring correlators which are exponentially falling, but they're giving directly the dimensions. Uh, okay, on and on and on. Right. I, I think I'll skip this. Um, that's for Poland, So, uh, okay. So um, I'll, I'll skip right to the right to the example. So we need to test whether it's possible to do field theory on R cross a sphere. The simplest non-trivial example is three dimensions R cross S two. The simplest known um, conformal field theory is the icing model at the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. So the idea is that we want to do simple things first. Um, we look at this cylinder which cross-sections our spheres. We go to a critical point where it's conformal and we say we're now doing something that's legal and we try to get the uh, critical properties of the 3D icing model. This has been done fairly well numerically, so if we get the right answer, we've got an idea that we got the right answer. Um, now, so we started off very simple-minded. Here's the icing model on a cylinder. This is the um, direct, these are the uh, nearest neighbor across the, um, should I use this pointer? Can I, I can advance it, and I can also advance it. Okay. Yeah, well, this is good, much better. Okay, so this is um, slices along the uh, log R direction. These are um, uh, discretization of the sphere, which I'll describe. And notice we don't do anything special. We just put uh, standard uh, coefficients, and uh, we hope that things are going to work out. This will advance it. Now, as I said, the, the best uh, you can do for a, s a sphere which is completely symmetric is a icosahedron. So now you have a subgroup of the rotation group. You can then refine it. The, re the refining I'll discuss a lot. This is where this is really the main thing. Uh, you take the triangles and you break them up into sub-triangles. Then you blow them up onto a, a sphere so that you think they're on a sphere. Of course, when you blow them up, literally they would distort their shape. But we were being very simple-minded. We didn't distort the shape. We just put exactly equal bonds, as you saw in the last thing. Uh, does this work? Well, okay. By the way, if you look at one of these things uh, in Mathematica, it looks pretty darn good. I mean, your eye is really hard. You look at that, doesn't that look like a nice discretization? Because good enough is not... By the way, I should say, our goal is to get the exact answer in the continuum limit. Good enough is not good enough in this business. A lot of people have played around with this, and we're trying to see whether you can do more than that. Okay. All right. So. Uh, the, the, the first thing you need to do is get rid of the unknown constants here. So what are the unknown constants? You have to get the critical point beta, because this is a new lattice. You have to find it. The other thing is you have to, this is like an um, uh, anisotropic lattice. We just arbitrarily treated the time direction and the, and the angular direction as having the same lattice spacing. 
So in fact, you need to adjust one constant, which is the analog of the speed of light. It turns out that the analog of the dispersion relation, which says that, uh, that um, e squared plus p squared, e squared is equal to p squared plus m squared with the speed of light one, the analog here is called descendance. It's exactly known. They're the, they're the uh, YLM uh, modes on the sphere. It's known that those descendants have exactly unit spacing, which is the speed of light being one in this context. And therefore, you test two things. You first go to the critical point of beta. Then you check the speed of light. Now you have no free parameters. You take the continual limit. You get the exact answer, and you're home. OK? That's the goal. So we try to do that. Uh, here is the standard thing of looking at a Binder cumulant. The Binder cumulant scales um, with these um, standard exponents. If you see this scaling curve, you've got beta very close to beta critical. In fact, in this case, um, we got uh, beta to a fairly high accuracy. It turns out you needed that. The larger the system is, the higher the accuracy you need. Uh, but that was good enough for our, our first simulations. Um, let me see. Sorry, let me go on. That's all beta critical. I won't give you all these details. Yeah, OK, here's the check. Here's the check that the speed of, I'm sorry. Um, where is it? I thought I had it. Oh, where is the check of the speed of light? All right, yeah, um, OK, I don't have it. That's right. So this is the measurement of the speed of light. What is yeah, it's this fit. OK, that's right. No, you're right. Yeah, this fit, the descendants here, the leading term uh, for the anomalous dimension is called mu 0 here in some unknown scales. We have to fix the scale. The first descendant is, is mu 1. The second descendant is mu 2. It turns out that icosahedral symmetry has irreducible representations for these three things, so you don't have to worry about the breaking uh, of the symmetry. And then this is measuring the speed of light. And the speed of light is 1 and a half. Actually, if we'd thought carefully, we would realize it was approximately 1 and a half because the um, sphere you'll see is triangulated. And it has six nearest neighbors, whereas the direction on the, uh, along the tube has two. And that's the two-thirds difference. It's probably not exactly that. That's sort of the classical limit of the speed of light. It's probably renormalized, but we could have easily put in the two-thirds. In fact, we are doing now just to be closer to unit to start with it, but it doesn't matter. You fix it. This is showing um, that the descendant relations are um, working, namely the distance between the primary and the first descendant and the first descendant and the second is uh, uniform. The ratio is 1. So it's all looking very happy and nice. Then you uh, look for the correlation length. The leading correlation length here is for the two spin operators, the so-called Z2 odd. This is an exponent. You measure it. It's actually, unfortunately, it's a very small uh, deviation from uh, the uh, uh, standard scaling. Because you're in three dimensions, um, the field phi has dimension a half. And therefore, this half is just the non-anomalous piece. On the other hand, on radial quantization, that comes in because of the compact nature of the sphere. So actually, it's not trivial that even you get the half right, because that does show that we've got the right manifold. But it's the easy part of it. The hard part is the anomalous piece, which is here you know, reasonably accurate. So it's sort of working. But I mean, of course, you know, proving things numerically is not, not a proof, usually. In fact, here is they disprove that it's working uh, perfectly. The um, next level, the L equals 3 level, is, is reducible under the icosahedral symmetry. So you can do the standard thing and ask, are you getting back the full rotational invariance of the sphere by looking at the two uh, uh, irreducible representations? We take them uh, to the continuum limit, and we see it's broken. Okay? And we see that it's clearly not getting back the full rotational symmetry. Now, with hindsight, we should have um, realized this. In fact, I think we sort of did, but we kind of tried to talk ourselves into it and think that it was OK. The answer was that we should not have treated the triangles as uniform after we blew them up on a sphere. Okay? So therefore, um, it dawned on us that um, maybe we should um, try to treat the field theory better on a sphere. Well, icing model is a very 
um, difficult field theory, it doesn't have continuous variables. So fortunately, um, we would we know that the phi four theory is in the same universality class. So we went over to a continuous uh, field theory, phi four theory, and then you start doing finite elements. So here's um, so here's your here's your new uh, field theory, which is supposed to be universally equivalent, but it now allows you to start to discretize this in a more clever way. Now, finite elements uh, take, uh, after all, this is, um, this in the continuum is a nonlinear differential equation for the classical equation. So finite elements are used for solving classical PDEs. And there are, I will explain a little bit what a finite element is, but there are theorems that if you do a reasonable element across a PDE, on any lattice that is reasonably regular, there's all kinds of conditions, that then all solutions will converge to the exact solution as you refine it uh, more and more. And uh, therefore, you're actually on, on very solid grounds. That is to say, you can say that you're going to represent this Lagrangian correctly as you take the lattice spacing to zero, so long as you use elements that are good enough. Okay, And there are criterion for good enough. If James Brannock was here, he would define good enough with the right norm. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that's fine. Uh, and we thought, well, that's essentially all we have to do. I will explain that um, that gets us. A, um, this is a talk where we keep trying to make progress. And unfortunately, I thought I was going to show you exactly how it completely worked. But I think we have one more step to take. Um, but OK, so so anyway, what what is finite elements? Well. You, on a curved manifold, it's very uh, straightforward. Uh, as I said, all of these triangles are literally not quite equilateral triangles. But you can take these points as we've defined them, blow them up, and find their precise positions. Then on this uh, surface, you can put a tangent plane, because of course it's locally flat, right? And then on that tangent plane, you can do standard uh, finite elements. And uh, let me explain to you what. Does everybody know what a finite element is? Does anybody want a, a, a quick, yeah. Belint, you want a quick uh, view of a finite element? No? You do know what they are. You don't know what they are. I'm really trying to put them on. I didn't know what they were. I mean, I, uh, by the way, I should say, it's very funny. I was trying to write down this finite element for a triangle. So let's do, let's do a simple thing. We want to do, we want to know, we have some triangle with three different points. And we want to know what is a good approximation to this um, piece of the Lagrangian. Or if you like, the differential equation that would come from that. OK? Now, um, actually, I was trying to do this calculation, and I sort of knew how to do it. And I was on an airplane to uh, California, and the guy next to me, I said, uh, yeah, we trade. What do you do? What do I do? He says, I'm applied mathematician. And then, he <laughs> and then, he, then I said, what kind of applied math do you do? He says, I do work on finite elements. So he spent the whole, the whole plane thing from Boston to California teaching me all of finite elements. It was fantastic. And then he thanked me for entertaining him. That was, was great. Anyway, so uh, what do you do? Well, the, the so-called linear element, let me do it in one dimension. Because it's so, if I, if I want to uh, approximate a curve, then we're just doing integration. And in one dimension, what we do is we set up an element, the first, the first, approximation of the element is you take an interval and you say there's one element that is 1 here and 0 there. right? And then there is another element that is 1 here and 0 there. Those are the two linear elements. If I now weight these things by two amounts, a linear uh, adds up to linear, that gives you a function interpolating there, which is called the trapezoidal rule. So the tra but it works for non-equal spacing, right? So linear elements in one dimension is a trapezoidal rule for integration. So what is the trapezoidal rule in higher dimensions? The answer is to set up a thing, which is 0, 0, and, and 1 here. That's one element. And then put 1 here and 0 there and so on. You have three elements. They're all linear. You put them on tent poles. And guess what? You get a roof that is flat. And that's the trapezoidal rule on a triangle, OK? Now, you can also go to higher order. It's very simple. If you want higher order, you take three points, and now you make a quadratic curve, which is one on one of these three poles and zero elsewhere. 
that's the quadratic element for um, a one dimension. You can do the same thing here. The only thing you need is you need to include neighboring triangles. So now you take these, you discover all the quadratic forms, give exactly um, uh, six different finite elements. They will, what it does is the following. A linear element will give you an interpolation that is exact for a linear function. A quadratic element will give you exact for a quadratic function and so on. You can do it to all orders, okay? And so what you're doing is you're taking your function space and truncating it, or your Hilbert space if you want, into a smaller space. But then that space converges to the real answer. So it's, it's a very clearly, you know, smart idea. Okay. So, uh, and... And the only thing you have to do as you refine it is not be too stupid. You can't do triangles that look like that. They must be kind of square. You can't have little triangles over here and large ones there. You need to have them all go to zero. And those are the goodness relations. If you do that, things converge. Right? So this clearly is a way to represent any scalar field Lagrangian in a way that it becomes the right Lagrangian. Okay? There's no problem with that. All right. Uh, okay. Here's a. And and as I mentioned, it turns out that if you look at the scalar field representation on the random lattice by these um, gentlemen, you'll discover that they used exactly finite elements. They didn't call them that because they reinvented it. Um, oh, and by let me yeah okay. And let me tell you uh, what this derivative is. It's a fancy formula, but the the formula finally is very it's, it's very um, comprehensible. If you want to know how much the derivative between this point and this point is, or what the quadratic form is, it turns out that, what is it? It's this distance squared. And then it is the Voronoi construction of the area that this thing owns going that way, right? And so, so it's then this uh, Voronoi area, OK? And that is the linear finite element, very nice geometrical thing. You just keep adding up all of the links. You have divide by the length to the, to the point, and then you take the area as you move around and keep adding it up. In, uh, if you want to do this a la Reggie calculus, it's even more elegant. In Reggie calculus, you take two vectors, E1, E2, and uh, you, discuss, you think of this point here. And then you look at the distance, um, the distance of formula to get here. Uh, I should put upper indices. And you call this a metric tensor. OK? And then it turns out that what do you want to do? You're trying to put a Laplacian, sorry, you're trying to put a Laplacian on a curved manifold like that. And it turns out that this same formula, <laughs> exactly the same formula, is equal to the sum over the square root of g, g i j. This is, you have to take the inverse of this matrix uh, times um, the um, phi i minus phi j l i j squared, summed over all the adjacent triangles. So there's amazing identities. You can write this in three different ways, and it takes a lot of algebra to show they're the same. And then you can generalize these to simplexes of any dimension, OK? So you can think of them both in Reggie calculus and, and differential forms and, and interpolating spaces. Uh, so anyway, after a while, you begin to believe it, that this is sort of uh, the right way to go. Here's an example. A demonstration. Um, Andrew, Andrew will, you will talk more about it. Yeah, uh, later. But here's a demonstration that you're on the right track. This is the Laplace operator uh, that um, uh, we had. The uh, left-hand part is the one that we, uh, the one I had when I didn't treat the triangles as having different sizes. So you see, here is the L equals 0, nice. L equals uh, 1, nice. L equals 2, nice. These are all protected by icosahedral symmetry. Here's the L equals 2. That was the problem that we saw in the spectrum. 
this thing is split. Here's the finite elements. Um, just for uh, our refinement uh, is the number of points inside the subtriangles. Okay, so S means we have eight points going across. So here it is. You see, you can't see the uh, breaking. You see a little bit of breaking up here. So clearly, finite elements is giving you the right differential operator. Uh, oops. Oh, I thought I had another curve here. Ah, yeah, OK. Um, here is a, a little bit more. Here is the entire spectrum averaged over the um, m quantum number. OK? And if you notice this, this looks a lot like a dispersion relation you would have on a, on a hypercubic lattice. It's the right dispersion relation here, then it messes out. Here's the statement where you actually see the breaking due to the azimuthal quantum number. So you see, again, it's good, and then it breaks. Here's a fit where you really uh, hammer it. And this is this the first part of the spectrum. And here's a fit to the spectrum, and it has to be L times L plus 1. And you see these two coefficients are good to about six decimal places. I mean, there's no doubt that this is actually giving you the right dispersion relation, OK? And uh, uh, Andrew will show even more on that. OK. So it's, it's working. And now let me, um, uh, let me now just go a little bit more into this geometry, because the geometry is actually, I think, interesting. OK. Uh, as I said, we have an element for a triangle. And you can do it many different ways, uh, pedestrian or more interesting. But the, most, the more interesting thing is, is uh, as I say, this is such a rich, a rich literature that you know, everybody has their same name. You can use what's called barycentric coordinates. You can think of the coordinate here as uh, the sum, is a weighted sum of the coordinates of the three points. And by the way, we use th uh, unit vectors from the center of the sphere. We do not use coordinates on the sphere because they're not well defined. We embed it in a larger space. And then you see the finite element is actually geometrically the following. The finite element that is 1 there and 0 and 0 here is actually just this sub-area, OK? Which is, which is clearly very cute. So the finite element is just the area of this uh, sub-thing divided by the total area. One reason I say that is that we actually did generalize them to using spherical areas. So you can actually not use flat areas but spherical areas, but I think to order a squared, it shouldn't make any difference. Because you know the tangent, it's basically not using a tangent plane, but use the curved tangent plane if you want. So there's all kinds of improvements. Um, uh, OK, here's exactly this, uh, as I say, sort of Reggie calculus way to look at it. Um, I guess I won't show you this. Yeah, here, I'm just showing you the same formula. Here's the formula that I wrote in terms of the Delaney. Here's the Delaney thing. That's the Delaney form. This is the uh, Reggie calculus form. As I say, they're completely the same. Um, the, you, what about curvature? Uh, from the point of view of, of um, flat triangles, the curvature is concentrated at the vertex. It's the deficit angle at this vertex. If you, ch if you don't like having discrete delta function um, a deficit, if you go to spherical triangles, there is no curvature there. And the curvature is actually then the, the um, the uh, deficit angle around a triangle, and it's distributed over the triangle. So if you don't want point, if you think the point defects are getting in your ways, all you have to do is change your code. Wherever you saw areas that used to be uh, areas for flat triangles, you write spherical triangle areas. You have no curvature deficits at the triangle vertices, but you have actually uniform, uh, average uniform curvature on the surface. Uh, anyway, so there's a lot of um, improvement schemes. Having said that, let's, uh, OK, so, so what, what happened? Strangely enough, this is the, uh, on it, this is the truth in uh, confession part of the, co the uh, talk. Strangely enough, when we went through all of this very nice machinery, went back to the three-dimensional problem that we we're talking about, tried to find very carefully the critical surface through the Binder cumulant. It looks good until you drive it very hard and you go to a very refined lattice. And the critical surface seemed to be sort of wigging, wiggling around. We had a really hard time finding it. And um, we don't, um, and, 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 and uh, so we didn't know what was going on. So when you can't solve the problem that is the simplest problem you think of, you go to a simpler problem, <laughs> OK? 
This, this is a retreat, okay? But it's not entirely a retreat. Actually, if you give up the, the goal of radial quantization for a moment, you can go to two-dimensional conformal field theories. And two-dimensional conformal field theories have a huge conformal symmetry, right? They have all, uh, con all um, holomorphic functions, okay? So a two-dimensional icing model or 5-4 theory written on a plane can be projected onto a Riemann sphere. And for two dimensions, that's also a legitimate manifold. Okay? And, uh, but it's not radial quantization, right? Because there's no radius. But it's exactly one slice of our cylinder. So it's like taking the um, length of the cylinder and just continually squeezing it and squeezing it and squeezing it. So you can think of it as sort of the infinite temperature limit of the problem that we're trying to solve. And so that has all the same problem of a curved manifold, but it's in one dimension less. The other nice thing about it is it's an exactly solved model. It's a conformal, it's the minimal uh, central charge, a half conformal field theory. This comes from my uh, dallying in uh, conformal field theory from the, the stringy side. All stringists know it, all, all condensed matter physicists know this. It's really the Onslager solution. Um, at the conformal fixed point, not the general one. And uh, so you know the exact answer. So we thought, oh, this is great because this is now a test of one feature. Can we deal with a sphere before we try to deal with a cylinder? Okay. And uh, so just to show you how it works, here's the um, stereographic or, or uh, projection. Uh, these are the, um, uh, let's explain to see. Okay. Th these are, yeah, sorry, these are the radial, these are the x, y, z coordinates onto the sphere. These are actually the angles on the plane. So I've used complex variables on the plane. This is the complex variables on the plane. Theta and phi are the, are the angles of the, onto the sphere. And this is the radial coordinate. In other words, x squared plus, or here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Okay? So this is the same coordinate system we've been using. Uh, here's what happens to a... Um, you have to take again out the, the analog of the while factor. So what used to be the power behavior becomes this correlation length. By the way, the exact four-point function is known. Here's the exact four-point function. The exact Binder cumulant is known. Everything is known, okay? So if you calculate this on this thing and you get the wrong answer, you're very sure when you get the wrong answer, okay? So uh, this is now our, our um, test framework. And um, uh, we thought, well, OK, uh, things would be going fine. Uh, but we tried this, and we got very good answers. Oh, I should go back here, I guess. It's a good thing this is a small group. I can be honest without being too embarrassed. Uh, OK. Um, so. What do I mean we got very good answers? Well, well, I'll start here. This is this correlation function, the correlation function here, actually projected onto um, YLMs. It's easier to write it as a, uh, in a Fourier space. And uh, you can barely see it, but um, which is the exact answer, Michael? The re oh, exact one is, the, is red. The red dots are exact. The, um, the uh, blue ones are numerical. It actually was a very first calculation. It's not done terribly carefully, but you know you, you can't argue that that looks like a good start. And here is the um, effect of rotational invariance breaking. We look at the terms that shouldn't be in the expansion, actually coming from the North Pole, and you see that the terms that are breaking are diving down very uh, rapidly as we refine the lattice to zero. So it looks like, one, we're getting the right critical exponent. Two, we're restoring spherical symmetry. How could you possibly not be happy? Uh, except for that we have um, macho uh, um, numerical people in our group, including George Fleming, who can't let any problem rest. <laughs> so you uh, and, and Michael. And you go to large and larger s. <laughs> And again, things start to look weird for the vindicumulant. By the way, the vindicumulant was also dead on here. Um, 
and things started to look a weird, little weird. Then actually, I looked back at the program and I realized that this area term here, I had mistyped in. Ah, oh, problem. No problem. Let's put the right area term in. It looked worse. <laughs> okay. So we have this funny thing that we actually have an area term which is getting very good results, but it's not the one given by all of this beautiful formalism. So that must be crazy, right? Um, now, then also, um, I started thinking more about where these defects are coming from. And they're actually coming from uh, uh, one um, correlator. So essentially, it sounds very, uh, doesn't sound very dangerous. If you look at phi i squared, oh, sorry, phi x squared, and x is now, x represents a point on the sphere, OK? And then you can look at this thing and um, project into YLMs. These are really unit vectors on the sphere. And this basically has these uh, breaking of uh, rotational invariance. And uh, then I was uh, uh, presenting some of this to Lucher, and he said, what about counter terms? And I said, ah, just what I was about to think of. Thank you for telling me. What about counter terms? Why counter terms? Well, Remember that finite elements says that, you know, you have a nice smooth classical solution. It will always go over to the right solution. But quantum field theories, unfortunately, are harder than classical solutions. Too bad James is not here. I want him to get this lesson. I keep telling him that quantum field theories sometimes bite you, even when classical ones don't. Um, and in particular, um, there is a mass renormalization, which is this one loop diagram, which is logarithmically, um, I'll write it in L space. This thing is log L if I cut off the uh, mode number, right? So there's a logarithmic divergence in this diagram. Now, in two dimensions, that's the only divergent diagram. In three dimensions, there's two. And what does that mean? It means it slams directly into the cutoff. And it measures a divergent quantity that knows about the cutoff. And the whole idea of this dispersion relation working was that somehow, at least in the perturbative regime, that somehow they would all be saturated by the part of the dispersion relation that looks good. That's what we do with lattice gauge theory when we try to prove that we, lattice perturbation theory is the same as continuum perturbation theory. We write down all of the diagrams, and we convince ourselves that renormalized perturbation theory works and that we get back the continuum perturbation theory. So there's nothing different here. The, the difference here is the following, and that is that this cutoff, so it really goes like some function, some constant log of in our case, we call the refinement S. Remember that S for us is really what you normally call one over the lattice spacing. So you get a divergent uh, constant like this. But our divergent constant is going to be slightly dependent on the position where this diagram sits on the sphere as we move around. In, in a regular lattice, you have a marvelous fact that we take for granted, but now I realize how important it is. If you translate from one lattice point to the other, it's exactly the same. So no one ever writes down this dependence on x because it doesn't depend on the lattice point, right? So translation invariance, even though it looks like a harmless, fairly harmless part of the Poincaré group, is an infinitely expanding group. And we have no infinitely expanding group because the icosahedron is the largest group that we can do perfectly. Our finite elements is attempting to expand that group as best we can. But it can never do it directly at the cutoff 
because at the cutoff, it is not exactly correct, okay? It is correct. I mean, in fact, this is, um, I think, uh, um, normally on a hypercubic lattice, we have this dual way of thinking about why we get the continuum limit. We, we say, let's do an operator product expansion and do derivative expansion around a point, right? And then we say we can classify our operators that way and the relevant, irrelevant ones disappear. What we, I forget <laughs> until now, which really hit me in the head, is that we know that it's the same Taylor series expansion at every point. So really what we're doing is going to Fourier space in our mind. And in Fourier space, we're saying the spectrum is good. In finite elements, it's only the spectrum definition that works. You do not do, you never do Taylor series expansion. In some sense, the Taylor series expansion was a stupid idea in the first place. It was accidental because a Taylor series expansion is exactly an expansion around the cutoff. So it's only because you can take the Taylor series expansion and reinterpret it in momentum space that it makes an argument for hypercubic lattices. So it's always the spectral problem. It's not the Taylor series expansion, right? They are a cutoff, right? And here, they're not the same. If you do a Taylor series expansion around any finite elements, you will discover that it doesn't have, you know, the second derivative of respect to the x-coordinate is not the same as the y-coordinate. And in fact, there's an xy-coordinate. It never becomes rotationally invariant. It's not that it get, becomes rotationally invariant of order a squared. It's not in leading order, right? So Taylor series expansions don't work. And therefore, the cutoff effects are there. OK, so. Um, we're now trying to keep track of cutoff effects, OK? Um, I hoped that by the time I gave this talk here that we would actually see just exactly how this worked. And we'd have beautiful numerical answers. It appears, uh, but we didn't. We don't. I am convinced that this is the last bug, <laughs> so to speak, in our reasoning, that all we have to do now is get the combination of low modes or fixed modes, any fixed modes converging in the propagator and compensate for the cutoff effects. Um, however, it turns out that it still is working better for the wrong area term. Just, I think it's just a kind of engineering better. It, it looks better faster than for the correct one. And the reason it's looking better is that the wrong one here, this was almost a constant. And when you do this loop graph, you have to realize that you're going to have a coupling constant here, which is the weight of this area term in front of the 5 fourth term. So you've got two kinds of variations in x here coming. One is from the propagator, which knows about where it is propagating. And that one, you know, I think it's sort of we we just handle. But we also have the fact that the strength of the vertex that goes into this graph is varying, OK? So now, uh, never give up. Um, there are um, beautiful ways to triangulate spheres, uh, which, by the way, are used by WMAP in order to try to get equal area surveys of the sky. I mean, it's used by everybody, of course, but they, they care probably more accurately than, than uh, people doing climate modeling and various finite element stuff, where they're really just trying to solve differential equations, and then more or less any kind of reasonable thing will converge. Uh, but if you're trying to survey the sky, and you want to take a triangle, and you want to say what the density is of uh, various um, extraterrestrial objects out there, you would like to have the density defined by equal areas, clearly, right? So it turns out that there is a way, not just this naive blow up, right? But there is a coordinate blow up, which can actually make the Delaney, yeah, to make the, can make the Delaney, oops, I'll try to draw it, okay. The Delaney air, uh, dual area is the area inside the uh, bisectors here, this uh, simplex, not very good drawing, okay? You, you take all of these lines and, and, and you, can, you can arrange a triangulation which the Delaney area 
is a constant. And that will get rid of this. So if we are kind of rolling down on the right thing, and we see that's the thing that has been getting in our face, then I hope that the combination of these things are um, really um, uh, what's, what's, um, what's our problem. And uh, in the end, uh, oh, OK. Well, all right. OK. In the end, uh, um, hopefully, by keeping track of the um, defects from the counted term, which, by the way, is not as simple as it sounds. But that's another story. But it's, um, it's um, OK. I guess it, let me get in discussion. It, counter terms, uh, well, I'll, 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 we'll dis I'll describe it later. Um, but anyway, um, just to show you that oh, here is the counter term. Can you see this? No. Damn Mathematica doesn't do it for you. Can you see that at all? Can you maybe the light goes down? I can't see it, and I even know what's there. Oh, it's hit better there. Well, oh, it's it's just this. Oh, I see. This has fallen down, so you can't do it. Yes. Well, okay, you can basically see it. All right. So I mean, just to show you that you know logarithmic divergences are there. Here is the if you if you. If the propagator, there's an adjustable parameter. When you, when you calculate a counter term, there's always a uh, scheme. And the scheme means you introduce a mass. So first of all, the divergence, you know, you can't have a log divergence without a scale. So there's more than one way to do a counter term. And so we have to not only, not only think about counter terms, but what is the best way to do it? Because if we get way knocked off the critical surface by this thing, then we're going to get way, then, then we'll be big trouble, OK? So, uh, there's a lot of, of, of messing around to get this to work correctly. And here, uh, if you can see it, this is our perfect logarithmic fit to the lattice counter term averaged over all the um, points on the sphere. And assuming that this thing is 1 quarter, this 1 quarter is the 1 half I mentioned for the anomalous dimension. This is the, this is the analog of a zero mass propagator on a sphere. Because it's compact, you get a quarter, right? So the actual dispersion relation is L plus a half quantity squared. So that's the zero mass scheme from this point of view. And it has a perfect log. Here's a scheme where we took this mass and put it up at an intermediate momentum, L. L is like momentum, right? 16, because you know basically we're, we're looking pretty good up to about that refinement. So you want to do is you want to not screw up the continuum part that's working. You want to set it at a scale which separates ultraviolet from infrared in a natural way. And uh, so I, I don't know if you can see it, but it's much the same, except for it has a slightly non-logarithmic uh, behavior in the beginning because, of course, it's diverging less until it gets beyond that, right? So anyway, there's no question that we have logarithmic uh, uh, scaling. And I also should mention. This is actually taking out the constant piece. This is just the piece that is varying with x, right? So I'm, I mean, clearly there's a constant piece. That's the standard logarithmic derivative. We're not interested in that. We're interested in correcting the lack of t rotational invariance. So I didn't really write this right. But what you do is you take, and first of all, you take this, con in effect, indirectly, you, this constant c. Uh, you sum over all the points, and you get c bar. Then you subtract that in your analysis, and you come back. And this is the this is the variating this is the x dependent logarithmic divergence. So there's no question that we do have this term. It's sensitive to our cutoff. This is a quantum effect. Finite elements for quantum field theory. It's not going to be exactly the same as quantum uh, finite elements for. Um, uh, classical theories. Um, but uh, in spite of the fact that we're having a frustrating time engineering this solution, I actually think we do have the concepts uh, straight. Um, and uh, so let us, let us assume that, um, <laughs> that we succeed. Um, I have been trying to do this uh, with my collaborators. What is it going on two years now? 
you have to remember that, uh, you know, I have the uh, pleasure of failing on multigrid for about 15 years before it succeeded. So I, I guess I've learned a lesson that you shouldn't be too um, discouraged if it doesn't work at first. Although, of course, I thought it was going to work in about a month. I mean, you know, <laughs> you need to have a combination of uh, unreasonable optimism. So anyway, suppose this does work. Well, then it turns out if we go back into this part of, of differential geometry language, um, the tangent sphere um, is a local coordinate system on the manifold. So you're immediately diving into this question of how do you make patches with local coordinate systems. In the case of finite elements for a scalar, you kind of don't have to think about that, although you might as well. After all, the thing I finally got was rotationally invariant, even though I had to put a, a coordinate system down. Now, on the other hand, spinners really care about rotations. And the um, a spinner uh, has, you need this map between the tangent plane, I've now called the tangent plane of C and the, local, and the manifold X. And you have this, um, let me see, where did, where did I write this? Probably, let me write it down. So for those people who have not worried about spin connections. I'm not giving you much formalism, but if you know what it is, then you'll appreciate it. Let me see, where is the spin connection? Ah, I tell you. Well, all right. It, it's, I mean, look, this, this Reggie calculus, this, this dyadic form of the, mat of the metric, those are the um, verbines, right? And the verbines are the transformation from the flat coordinate system to the curve one, and the transformation from the flat metric to the converge one, if I go back here, is the way you tell the gamma matrices how to live on curve space. So uh, the uh, Dirac equation on a curve space is written this way. This is the analog of having um, this uh, g mu nu for scalars, OK? And then um, you can uh, take uh, the fermions and put them on a curved manifold and then try to keep track of the very sexy thing that fermions do, that when you rotate by 2 pi, it picks up a minus sign. However, when you're on a triangulated lattice or, or hypercubic lattice, you're never quite sure whether you went around by 2 pi or not, because you go clunk, clunk in very big things. So there is a consistency condition that the manifold has. There's an arbitrary um, sign convention at every point on the space. Actually, it looks like a gauge theory in which these are the gauge variables. And then it turns out that if the spin connection exists on a manifold, this constraint can be solved. We can figure out how to do it on a sphere. It works. There is actually a, a valid spin connection on a sphere. It is a, it is a discrete version of it. You can do more or less the same um, thing for vectors, um, namely the uh, gauge fields. Of course, they're simpler. They don't have this minus sign. Uh, if you, I think, look and squint very hard at these uh, formulas that Chris Freiberg and Lee wrote down, uh, they are sort of compactified versions of these. It's interesting. Their, their paper, I should say, one of the reasons that random lattices uh, didn't take off is that they were very ambitious. Um, in the case of gravity, they were trying to do dynamical gravity which is still an open problem, of course, but very hard. Then you want to sum over all manifolds. In the case of uh, Chris Friedman Lee, they wanted to use a random lattice because they thought, on average, it would get rid of all defects of um, rotation and translation invariance, on average, or at least rotational invariance. And they thought it would cure the uh, Fermi undoubling problem. From our point of view, learning now about finite elements, is the problem is that random lattices do not obey these regular, these regular conditions that, that, that give you convergence. So I think that random lattices are maybe interesting, but, when, but please don't use them if you don't have to. <laughs> what you want is the least random lattice, OK? Particularly if your manifold is differentiable and you want to take a continuum limit. So the finite elements is a sort of the um, keeping under control. <laughs> The random lattice. And so um, I think if you look at, and, and then they, it's very interesting in their paper, they, they're very beautiful papers, you should read them. They, they actually start from 
uh, differential form uh, uh, like this. And basically, you can see why they're falling into um, uh, finite elements, because its starting point is almost the same. At one point, they have one sentence that says, uh, and we could do this on a sphere, <laughs> period. And they never go, go farther, OK? So they're always in flat space and always random lattices. Nonetheless, uh, I think that um, uh, I think that, uh, the, that what they're doing is, is essentially correct. And then uh, last night, um, when James Brannock had uh, a beer, which I, we both drank for him, uh, <laughs> and uh, he started telling me about Nedlick and Whitney uh, finite elements. And the more I think about it, um, which was just when I was rewriting this talk, I think he's sort of onto something. What they're saying is the following. Um, First of all, they, it's a huge, hugely beautiful um, exterior uh, calculus made discrete. But the point is the following, that a finite element, which is say 1 here, 0 here, and 0 here, is putting the um, variable at a site. And that's nice for a, um, a spin 0 object. But you can have a finite element, which is actually very simple, which is 1 here and 0 and 0 here, but it's 1 here. And then that's the place which you need to put um, a gauge or a vector field, OK? So there are, when you have uh, finite elements in higher dimensions, you have um, points, lines, you have the boundary operator, and so on. You have the entire exterior uh, calculus can be translated into discrete form. And it tells you where to put these frames and where you, you you know all this? How come you're just nodding all the time? Or just uh, yeah? It's giving me an uneasy feeling that I, you should be giving the lecture. Oh, you have? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this exterior calculus with Brown complex and the uh, kind of combination of, of uh, edge elements and yeah. uh, vertex elements. Yeah, yeah. And then of course you can also think about the about the uh, kind of the next step doing the doing uh, base elements. Yes. No no no, you just keep going. You have the whole you have the whole um the RAM uh, sequence, yes. Exactly. Yes. And, uh, sort of I mean, I don't know. Uh, we never really got to the point where we knew how to test the Well, this is the right thing to do, I guess. I mean, we were on this track, I guess, or James yeah. was on this track a couple yeah. of years ago. Well, we should probably continue to, um, to, to talk about this then. Yeah. But, but I mean, l let, me, let me be clear. Uh, as I started off, and I, I was serious about it, is my reaction to using finite elements in lattice gauge theory is no way um, in the world. That was not a completely uneducated reaction. There are real problems to doing this, OK? On the other hand, um, so I, I'm, I'm, but I am convinced that there are at least some problems like this. Uh, by the way, in StatMec, there are problems. Uh, graphene is a beautiful lattice. Um, and they actually want to know the dynamics on lattices that have non-trivial manifolds, because you curl it and snip it and put it together. So actually, you can see quite nice papers on graphene, which actually do some of this stuff. <laughs> um, so I'm sure that there is some place where this stuff uh, works. The um, difficulty of gauge fields are, um, are not, uh, not to be dismissed, OK? I'll make a remark on that. But, but I think that this does have a future now. And, uh, and I think there are some problems for which this um, is, is important. Um, all I know about this uh, formalism I read in a half an hour, it was completely obvious to me. Yes. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I kind of know it, quick, the continuum version of it, so it wasn't too, too hard. Um, but um, I, I think it goes back to, so if we're getting a discussion, let me, I think it goes back. I know, I know, I know. This is a discussion. But, but I'll make a remark, which was basically a remark at the end of the day. In the earlier multigrid, we used the renormalization group because we thought of the fields as smooth. In other words, we were treating, if you like, we could be treating the gauge fields as if they weren't compact. Okay? And then there is this looser condition, which I think you mentioned, or someone mentioned, that you know, if you have uh, plaquettes small enough, 
then there is no uh, defect. And that means that there's a mapping. You see, the problem is the following. If I have a, a phase factor here, and I have a phase factor here, you can't map from one to the other uniquely unless it's very smooth. And you, know, you don't know what the, the curl is. But in a, in, a, in a restricted space, you can. I think what's happening here is the same sort of thing, that just like the early multigrid worked until it got rough, there's going to be a finite element view of this thing until it gets rough. And then you're going to have to do some new things. I don't think they're impossible, but I think you're going to have to take another step. No, I, 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 I mean, I'm, I mean, look, I think I, ideas like this are, are very important to think through. Um, sure. I don't think that's the way I would see it from a quantum field theory direction, but that's some... Um, I mean, maybe there are different ways of viewing this concept. I mean, I, I'm just saying that people have thought about these concepts. Maybe already have more ideas that go in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, look, uh, clearly the, the answer is yes. I mean, yes, we should look at the ideas and try to figure out. But the point is that jumps that are fixed are just new boundary conditions on classical uh, equations of motion. That, I think, one can handle. Remember here, what's happening is that, um, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, OK. Here, remember what's happening is that you have an ultraviolet divergence. And therefore, you have a random variable on this, this chaotic thing. And, and in fact, it's well known it's well known that in a quantum field theory, the differentiable functions have zero weight in the path interval, right? And so that's the problem. And, and they're undetermined, right? So I think it's related, but I don't think you can fix these jumps. They've got to be dynamically, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but but the the the. I don't know. Maybe no, no. But I, I'm just telling you that the trick I think one has to do is Wilson's trick. You see, Wilson says this thing gets out of bond, and then he maps it into this, which is a completely smooth differentiable function on a different space. So I think it's actually not that the function will have jumps. It's that you have to go to a different space, a nonlinear space, in which to view them. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I mean, it's a technical difference, not maybe too profound. And I think thinking through where one meets the other, I think, is right. But th that has turned out to be the way to keep gauge invariance. Right? Particularly in non-abelian things, you have to do that. So it's not a jumped field. It's a wrapped manifold. OK? That, that's the distinction. Right? The derivatives are perfectly fine on this. OK, yeah. Okay. any other? Comments or questions? Sorry I went too long, but um, OK. OK, so let's thank Rich and uh, come back in half an hour. If you're giving your talk in the next session, please uh, come see me so I can download your talk onto my key. Okay, like it? Perfect. Can you give my talk too? <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, I mean what, what, what I wanted to get people to realize is that we're thinking, right? Oh, yeah. Because no, we are thinking. I think this is a really great thing. Well, the good thing is, what do you do with the mic? Sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> so everybody's going to say. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for the record, too, uh, <laughs> what you said about that. Uh,
Chair. <laughs> Chair. Chair. <laughs> Mike Clark from NVIDIA, Harvard, Edinburgh, uh, Boston University, uh, Caltech. Did I lose, did I miss any of your institutions? Oh, sir? Caltech, Harvard, BU, Edinburgh, and NVIDIA. Is that, okay, good. I spent some time at Columbia as well. Oh, Columbia. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Rich. Okay, so I'm going to be talking pretty broadly about um, algorithms on GPUs for last QCD today. Most of the focus, as keeping with most of the workshops so far, will be on linear solvers. So. I'll give you a quick introduction to GPU computing. Does everyone here know how to spell GPU? Do you know what GPUs are? Anyone who doesn't know what a GPU is? Excellent. Um, a quick introduction to the CUDA library, 
and then we'll get into different solvers, um, so mixed precision solvers, strong scaling solvers, eigenvector solvers, and multigrid, um, and I'll be thinking about the future, um, what, what's, what, what directions to look at in the future before summarizing at the end. Um, so, actually maybe I need to click for this. So why do we have GPUs? Why do G um, So this is a shot from Wolfenstein, um, and if this is going to work, here we go. That was the state of the art in 1993. That was the first 3D shooter. Um, and there's, um, if we flash forward 20 years, um, maybe like this. Um, you could, this is an also Wolfenstein game. This um, GPUs are where they are today because of the desire to get to photorealistic graphics, um, and the, the required compute power to go from the original Wolfenstein from 1993 to the, the, this, the, this recent one, is a huge exponential increase in compute power. And we're nowhere near um, photorealistic graphics yet, so there's still a huge way to go yet. But this, the gaming industry is, are we okay? The gaming industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, and so the fact we have GPU computing um, is, well, GPU computing is possible because you can piggyback on this multi-billion dollar industry, which is hell-bent on getting to photorealistic games at some point in the near future. I'll think about how, how far that is and how far GPU's got to scale before we get that far and how much more GPU computing we're going to have um, or before we can expect it to tail off. Uh, no time soon is the conclusion there. But because of this, you can you have this a huge parallel processor, many core processor, which you, is highly programmable. As you get to more realistic graphics, um, you actually have to make the processor more programmable. You have to actually put physics simulations inside your games, and so the GPU you have now is just this incredibly wide mini-core processor you can program with C++ or Fortran or whatever you like. So what is a GPU? Um, on, the, on the right here, I've got a hierarchical diagram of what a GPU looks like. I start in the bottom here. You've got blocks of multiprocessors. Each of them have got a bunch of cores in them. Um, this is actually a group of SIMD units. Um, um, the marketing speak would say a bunch of cores, but they're really a group of SIMD units in here. And as you go from bottom to top, you're moving away from the processing uh, pipelines. So you go to registers, you go to cache, L1 texture cache. Texture cache is a special type of graphics cache, which is a holdover. But, um, and you go to L2 cache, and then you go off chip, device memory, and then you go connect through the host through the PCI Express bus. So as you go from bottom to top, you're increasing latency, decreasing bandwidth. Um, the memory bandwidth from off chip to on chip, um, the device memory bandwidth, um, is typically what um, determines the performance of many algorithms on G in GPU computing, and that's especially true on Lattice QCD. Um, so you're programming this architecture using a, a many or massively oversubscribed threading model, which um, is just a simple extension of C or C++. Um, but you can use any kind of language that you can think of almost, whether it be MATLAB to keep um, the mathematicians happy, um, Fortran, Python, um, C, C++, Java, any language you can think of, it probably runs in the GPU, or someone is doing a research project to work out how to port it to the GPU. Um, so if you take a bunch of these processors together, so one thing I didn't highlight was that um, you have the many number of processing cores, um, you end up with a huge uh, processing rate, um, which is required to drive today's games. You, you tie a whole bunch of these GPUs together with soggy string, and you get something that looks like this, which is the number two fastest supercomputer in the world. Um, I know Ballant knows it very well because he spends quite a bit of time running it. Um, so this is a computer based at Oak Ridge. Um, it's a Cray system where it takes AMD CPUs and um, connects it to NVIDIA GPUs and then tie all tied together with a Cray interconnect. Um, so you want to run QCD on these type of machines. Um, and one thing I also want to point out is this, this idea of a very wide architecture with very deep hierarchy where you have to pay a lot to go um, to increasing levels of cache and to go off chip is basically the future of computing. Whether it's a CPU, whether it's a GPU, we have to spend more and more energy to go off chip. You have to spend more and more energy to go across chip. Computation in that regard is free compared to memory movement. So all the algorithms, whether that's QCD or any type of HP application, 
unless they're DGEM, something very trivially compute bound, most of the effort, if we go forward to the exascale and the zeta scale and the yotta scale and whatever scales after that, will be on managing these very wide architectures that are getting very deep. OK, so we have these big supercomputers um, with GPUs in them. You want to run QCD on it. Um, how do you do that? Well, you can write your own code to do that. Um, to make it easy for people, I would suggest that people use CUDA. So CUDA um, stands for QCD on CUDA. CUDA is the programming abstraction that NVIDIA has for programming GPUs. Um, so this is an effort that Rich, myself, and a few others started at BU in 2008 to run Babbage, uh, a grad student that was there at the time called Kipton Barris. It started off just as a summer project to play around with trying to make a linear solver go fast on a single GPU. And it accidentally evolved into a production library. Um, there's some warts as a result of the way it developed. Um, but it's mostly a, a stable, fast library for getting people onto doing GPU computing quickly for QCD. So it has all, most of the solvers you could think of, certainly the traditional solvers, um, for all the different direct discretizations. So Wilson, Clover, Twisted Mass, Twisted Mass Clover, Domain Wall, Mobius, all the things you can think of staggered. They're all in there. Um, and all the traditional Krilov solvers. But it also has um, all the additional routines you need for doing HMC. Uh, so the thing that CUDA does well and does very well is to focus on high performance. And so maximally getting the maximum performance through really mining the, the symmetries of the problem and using bleeding edge methods to get the most scalable, optimal solvers. Um, so things that we do is um, so exploiting the physical symmetries that means using things like um, SU3 um, gauge compression to only store eight numbers or 12 numbers of the, instead of storing 18 numbers to minimize memory traffic. Um, mixed precision methods, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Um, lots of auto-tuning, so you've got performance compatibility between running on a GPU from one era to another era. You want to make sure you don't have to retune your code all the time, so it's got a, uh, an intricate auto-tuning engine to simplify all that so the user doesn't have to really care about that. Um, domain decomposition preconditioners for getting good strong scaling, eigenvector solvers, and multigrid solvers as well. So I'll be talking about many of these things. And the multigrid and eigenvector uh, is all kind of new stuff to CUDA. So CUDA is a big open source project, community driven. Um, as, as the project gets bigger and bigger, the font size here gets smaller and smaller. And I have to add more and more people at one point. I'm going to have to parallelize this to a second column or something. Um, it's on GitHub, so it's, it's very easy to follow. Anyone can get involved if they want. They have to send me an email, and then I add them as a, you can give access to, you can have push access to the repository, though anyone can branch it if they want. Um, in the SIDAC software stack, it normally fits in as a level three package. So that means it provides pre canned solvers and algorithms that can be plugged into higher level packages, though there are some folk that use CUDA as a standalone package into itself. Oops, that way. So um, there will be very few equations in this talk, thankfully. Um, uh, so we start off with, we want the Dirac operator, we want to solve it very quickly. So this is just a Mickey Mouse slide of what the Dirac operator looks like. Um, so the symmetries of the structure of the operator are what help us get high performance here. So the things that we need to think about are the, 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 the tensor product here of the, the color and spin degrees of freedom. Um, the, then, so this is just the Wilson operator here. Of course, there's all the other types of operators we care about. Um, but the, all this thing is just a stencil operator, of course. Um, and the nature of the eigenvector spectrum will typically decide what solver to use. So how do we map this guy to a GPU? So GPUs need huge degrees of parallelism. You need to uh, many, you need to oversubscribe the cores with many more threads than there are cores. Um, so how do you have a fine, so you want a fine-grained parallelization approach for GPU computing. So the obvious thing to do there is to parallelize over every site in your lattice, um, which is kind of trivial to a QCD person. Um, so if you have a volume of XYZT threads, um, uh, you have Say for 24 to the 4, you have a, a huge number of threads. So even going to 16 to the 4, you still have a huge number of threads. You're targeting something like 10,000, 20,000 threads minimum. You need that to saturate the GPU. And so you have a, a huge degree of parallelization available in QCD because it's data parallel. So to implement the D slash operator, um, you have one thread assigned to every site. And that thread's going to be responsible for loading in the gauge field and the adjacent spinner. 
um, doing the multiplication between those two and then storing the result. So it's a gather operation. Um, and so this operation is going to be memory bandwidth bound. So what that means is you're not doing enough compute versus memory traffic to saturate the, the GPU's high peak uh, flop rate. And so you have to do everything you possibly can think of to reduce memory traffic. So as I mentioned before, you could do matrix compression on the SU3. Um, so CUDA has 12 or 8 number support. Um, so as you compress the matrix more and more down to the minimum 8 numbers, what you're doing is increasing the amount of work you've got to do once you've loaded that data back into registers. So if you load in 12 numbers, what that means is you're loading in the first two rows of the SU3 matrix, and you've got to get the third row by taking the outer product, the cross product of the first two. For eight reconstruction, you've got to do a lot more work. Um, also, you can do similarity transforms to increase the operator sparsity, so picking a specific basis of the Dirac matrices, of the gamma matrices, or even do um, uh, gauge transforms to, to, mint, to get unit um, gauges, gauge fields down one direct dimension. And CUDA takes this even further by going down to 16-bit. If you, go to, if you have your precision, you have your memory traffic. And so there's a lot of thought there on how to make that a stable solver by truncating precision. But I'll get to that in a second or two. Um, so the basic thing is, as you decrease memory traffic, you get higher flop rate. So let's see that in action. Um, so on the x-axis here, we're increasing the temporal extent, the t dimension, and we're holding the x dimension fixed. And so this just represents more parallelism as we go left to right. Um, and you can see. Um, that as we reduce memory traffic, which is in each of these different lines here, so we start off with doing um, single precision at the bottom three here, um, where we're doing with 12, parameterized, 12 number parameterization of the gauge field, eight number, and then do gauge fixing as well. Um, while each of these things is increasing the amount of work each thread's got to do, you're actually increasing the flop rate at the same time. And by flops here, I only mean the real algorithm, the real physics flops. I'm not counting the overhead of doing the reconstruction of the gauge field and things like that. And then if you jump to half precision, performance essentially doubles. Um, and then, so you can see um, that all this effort of doing minimizing memory traffic really pays off in actual performance. So you want, you've got your d slash operator, you need a linear solver. So CUDA has you know, all the, the... So there's two similarity transforms. You do... Um, you use a non-relativistic Dirac basis, which is just a similarity. I, I use the word similarity transform because it's a holdover from speaking to non-physicists. Um, so you just you switch to the non-relativistic basis. So gamma four becomes diagonal instead of gamma five. And then when you're loading in the spinner field in the temporal direction, you have your memory traffic because it's effectively already spin projected. So going the gathering from T plus, you only need to gather the first half of the. Com no, when you when you do the forward gather in the temporal dimension. Then you only need to grab the bottom 12 spin, com the bottom 12 components of the 24 component color spinner vector, and then going backwards, you only need to grab the top two. That, that's all. In fact, that's all included in there automatically. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the gigaflops here is just algorithm the gigaflops, just the same giga effective gigaflops you would if you're running on a regular CPU code. So I don't include all the overhead of doing things. Like that. The other similarity transform you can do is transform to uh, tra transform your gauge field so you can have down one dimension, you can have um, you can have unit gauge except for a boundary term, and so if you if you know your gauge fields are units, then you don't need to load them, and so that's what ga uh, GF for gauge fixing is here. So we gauge fix so the unit gauge field all down to except the down except for a boundary term at the end, and then so you're reducing memory traffic there as well. Um, I don't bother with the last. You could do that, but yeah, there's, there's, that, 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 the improvement there is ridiculous. Is no, nothing to that final surface. It's an interesting thing also is that um, all these um, all these compression tricks rely on the fact you've got SC, SU3, and so if your matrices aren't quite SU3, as, as did, we did some early experiments, experiments with Balan, if your if your matrices aren't SU3 quite, so if you store your gauge field in single precision, like when you write it out to disk, when you load it back in again. Um, and you rely on the fact that you've got SU3 matrices, you'll end up with errors in your compression because your matrices don't quite line up properly. So you need to reunitize them to, on the SU3 to say double precision before doing gauge fixing and eight reconstruction. Otherwise, you can introduce errors back in there when you reconstruct your matrices. Um, OK, so linear solvers. Um, so we've got conjugate gradient on the right here, just a little cartoon. 
Um, so you want the entire CG algorithm to run the GPU. So as well as having a fast D slash operator, you also need to have all the BLAS1 kernels. So that means the global sums here and here, and these adding and scaling of vectors. Um, so CUDA has to implement all that. What's interesting to know is that these, um, these BLAS1 operations are bandwidth bound and latency bound. And all they do is just slow down the relative gigaflops performance relative to the matrix vector product, the D slash. Um, and this actually gets worse. As, as architectures get faster, we can put a lot of effort into having nice cache blocking algorithms to maximize the use of the locality in the D slash. But the BLAS becomes the Amdahl's law part of the solver. And so this pushes you into a regime where you have to think about better solvers to get better scaling because um, this thing has an Amdahl's law problem in itself. Um, so you can rectify this by having a good preconditioner in here so you spend as little possible time in the outer global sums and scaling here. Um, also using SDEP methods, which I mentioned yesterday. So SDEP methods are a, a reordering of the operations in linear solvers. So you can, um, instead of doing like um, D slash, um, so effectively here we're doing D slash and then a, a bunch of BLAS ones, um, global sums. It effectively reorders the operations so you can do uh, S D slash operations and then uh, a block um, normalization problem. Um, and so you can, by re refactoring your operation like this, you get much better scaling because you can um, reduce the number of global sums from like two or three per iteration to one every S iterations. There's stability problems in there, so you can't take it that like S greater than five or 10 or something, but it's a huge step in improving scaling for the global sum point of view. Oh yeah, so you do, you, you, well, so the global sum scaling is just, it's the latency problem. And so it doesn't matter. So by doing like a block QR decomposition, which is what you end up with instead of like a simple vector dot product, you end up with a block QR. The, you know, th there's like a one-time latency cost for that. So you, it's a huge improvement in scaling. And so we haven't got that implemented yet. Like Justin's supposed to be talking about it next week at the last conference, but I know his results are nearly there yet. So um, it's another couple of weeks off yet. Having this, this block, tall, it's, a, it's called the algorithm, the orthogonalization algorithm is called TSQR, so it's tall skinny QR because you have a bunch of vectors you need to orthogonalize. Um, this is a bit of a pain to implement this algorithm on a parallel machine. So, so just so I understand, like, your SDEP configuration, you're just keeping a bunch of conjugate vectors and then delaying more conjugate Essentially, yeah. So why would you then just use one of these other fancy algorithms that keeps all the vectors? You know, it, sometimes does not turn conjugate gradient into conjugate vectors. These other TCRs or something. So you can't do this with GCR. You can do it with GMRES. You can't do it with GCR. So GMRES also has this SDEP as a SDEP method as well. Well, you need to modify it to get it into this nice factored form of doing TSQR. So you have the one-time latency cost. So regular naive GMRES doesn't needs to be a little re, needs to be a little refactored to get the one-time latency cost of paying this big this, this regular TSQR. It's not quite GMRES needs less modification, but it does need a little bit of modification. Um, and it, interesting, they can that crops up from the numerical point of view. If you essentially just take like a vector and apply A to it, or apply D slash to it multiple times, and then take all those ve intermediate vectors, it's numerically unstable to do that, because you're just doing the, the ma ma power method there, and you, all you end up with is the large eigenvector. Um, so what you need to do is work, actually need to do a polynomial in A, so you need to do a shifted A, and then construct the term of the shifted A, where you, so you need some estimate on the bounds of the eigenvector to make this a stable algorithm. Uh, you know, these are all details that people have worked out in the math community. Uh, Jim Demmel is big into S-step methods. Or they're also called communication avoiding solvers. So, um, so, when you, so take the D slash, add on the linear algebra, and you have solver performance here. So if we look at um, here, we saw that the, the, just the D slash performance you know, goes up to between 500 and 800 gigaflops, and the D slash is 300 to 400. This is on a GPU from a couple of years ago. Um, then you look at the actual solver performance, you can see the performance goes down. So what was in the range 500 to 800 is now in the range like, 400 to 500. So that's the Amdahl's law hit of doing all the extra linear algebra on top of the D slash. And single precision is you know, 400, 500 goes down to 200, 300. Um, so here's just a comparison of CPU and GPU. So you put all this effort in, and you end up with a solver which just runs faster than the CPU. Um, either that, um, otherwise, it'd be a waste of time, I guess. Um, this is a kind of a weird plot. Um, 
So the normalized performance is versus a dual socket CPU. So two CPUs um, is a performance of one. So one CPU is a performance of a half. One GPU is a performance of 3.7, and two GPUs are a performance of 6.8. Um, uh, yeah, so one GPU is worth about seven CPUs in this metric. OK, so mixed precision. So using mixed precision for, turns out, for Clover or Wilson fermions, when you've got bicycle stub, works really well. Um, so using residual injection or reliable updates, um, but in, in where you re-inject a new residual periodically to, um, with a high precision variant while doing most of the work in low precision, um, this works great. And um, a nice result that Balance sent me a few months ago was that four GPUs sustain about two teraflops in the solver. Um, which is quite nice. Um, it doesn't work very well in conjugate gradient algorithms, though. So that means staggered, twisted mass, domain wall. Um, so just using a double single solver, so doing most of the work in single precision with occasional correction to double, have you, in, you have increased iteration count over a pure double precision solver. And actually, double half is usually non-convergent. So why is this? Well, um, my initial reaction was, well, by CG stab, so noisy enemy, so it doesn't matter what you do. But, um, more accurately, the CG recurrence relations are just much more intolerant and break down when you have when you have deviations. Um, you don't have this the, the global orthogonalization problem property you have with CG, which you don't have with by CG stab, is broken in CG, and so it's just it's much more intolerant of screwing around. Um, so we want to make CG more robust and make double half work because that effectively doubles your performance or near close to doubles your performance, and. Um, if you're using these mixed precision solvers in like the context of a multi-shift solver, um, what you tend to typically find is that if you do most of your work in single precision, or a, then you have to do a correction on each of the shifted terms after the, the regular multi-shift is done. Um, so how do you do stable mixed precision CG? Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, there's a few things you need to do to make CG robust for, for, for mixed precision or make it more robust. Um, so, uh, as well, so the regular by CG stab algorithm, mixed precision by CG stab, you occasionally reproject in the high precision residual. So, in conjugate gradient, you should you also need you, you do that, but you also need to reproject the gradient vector to make sure it's orthogonal as well. So that helps. It's another thing you need to do over by CG stab. The alpha parameter which is this guy here, and the ratio of the residual, uh, this, you know, the ratio of residual squared over the dot product with the, with the matrix vector product in here. Um, so and this is chosen so you're minimizing the, the, the error, the A norm of the error. Um, and the error on A, sorry, the, the error on A where A is a low precision matrix vector product um, is, is different from the error um, that you have in the actual the actual truncation error you get from using low precision as the solver moves on. So you've got you have an error introduced by the fact by virtue of the fact that your matrix vector product has errors in it. Then you have errors, um, because you're storing your solution vector in low precision. Every time you add, every time you accumulate your solution vector in low precision, you're introducing new truncation errors. So we can trivially fix that latter error by making sure that our solution vector is always in high precision. Um, and so that means that we do actually. Um, so all this effectively means is that this x vector here is always in high precision, um, and that doesn't cost anything in performance. Um, the last thing you need, the last thing, uh, so you have the beta computation here, um, and so beta computation relies on the global orthogonality pro pro property, and this thing breaks down in finite precision. Um, but it turns out from nonlinear CG, there's a there's a variation, there's a whole bunch of variants on how to calculate beta, but there's an, another nice one called Polak with Gary, which um, increases the self-stabilizing nature of CG by doing, has some local orthogonality properties. So it helps you keep on the regular convergence path of what infinite precision CG would have. Um, so I'll show you what the effect of doing this in a second is, but I think there's probably further improvement possible here. Um, where I'm mining the literature on this is understanding fault tolerance solvers. People are, a lot of people are thinking about what happens if your big parallel machine breaks down um, and you get an error because you know, some bit got flipped over there and ECC didn't catch it. You know, machines are getting harder and harder, or especially go to bigger and bigger scale, but people are thinking we have to be more fault tolerant. 
So what's mixed precision if not just introducing faults? And so I think there's a lot of similarity between mixed precision and fault tolerance. So yeah, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm spending some time in the literature at the moment. So what happens when you do this? So the green line here is double precision, pure double precision solver. Um, the black line is half precision, uh, double half precision using the naive CG without these improvements I just described. And then you add in these improvements and you see that the double half solver uh, is the, the improved double half solver is the red line here. So you can see a huge improvement in the stability. These big jumps here are, are due primarily to the truncation of the solution vector being in low precision. Um, and each time you get a jump here, that's when you're injecting a new residual. Um, so that just goes away and you see that the convergence is almost identical. It's like 5% overhead. So this is a, a relatively heavy quark mass. You go to very small, a smaller condition number. You can see the old double half solver did crazy stuff. It didn't converge at all. Whereas double precision, you can actually see it's, it's wavering a little bit here. It should be, comp it should be a perfect, but there is finite precision errors even double precision. Whereas the new solver now is not perfect. There are little humps here, but you can see it's a lot better than it used to be. So we now have a fairly stable double half solver we can use. Um, okay, so you have a fast linear solver, and we need to go to multi-GPU because you have these big supercomputers. We've got thousands of GPUs. Titan has 18,000 of them. Um, so trivially, trivially, you want to do, you know, simply and cut up your lattice and stick different domains into different GPUs, and you want to exchange faces, and you, you want to overlap the exchange of these faces with the interior computation to get good strong scaling. Um, so you, you know, the GPU allows you to overlap transfers and computation using a thing called the CUDA stream API. Um, you need some packing kernels to get contiguous data for MPI because it wants big, uh, it wants big messages, not, not fine-grained messages. Um, and you can use... Um, direct GPU to GPU communication through the network without going through the CPU on the nearest uh, GPU clusters. Um, this is a thing called GPU direct. Previously, you had to stage your data in the CPU, and that adds extra latency, so that hurts your strong scaling. So that can be avoided now. So what happens when we, um, gets, when we put this on a, a big machine? So this is from probably Blue Waters. I guess it's probably balanced data that's been mangled by NVIDIA marketing. Um, so we have number of nodes along the x-axis here. Um, so the CPU here is the blue line where we're comparing against XE6, which is a CPU-only Cray machine with two CPUs per node. Um, and the green line is GPU, one CPU plus one GPU per node. So in terms of CPU to GPU comparison, you need to multiply by a factor of two here. Uh, but this is a node-to-node -node comparison. So it's two CPUs versus, two, versus one GPU, effectively. And you can see that the GPU has a nice big speed up, but then at some point, both the CPU and the GPU fail to strong scale anymore. Um, the GPU ceases to strong scale a little bit earlier um, because it's going faster, so there's more, um, more penalty from, there's more penalty for not keeping up with communication. So you want better strong scaling. So this is where we come to communication reducing algorithms. We want to reduce internode communication, and we want to introduce, re reduce internode synchronization. Um, the synchronization is global sums, of course, and internode communication is the face exchange. Uh, so the easiest thing we can do uh, are, is to think about ad, uh, domain decomposition techniques. Um, so this is an, a diagram um, taken from these guys' proceedings a few years ago, um, just trivially showing how to do domain decomposition, where you partition your lattice into different domains. And we talked about this yesterday, the uh, Mateus's talk. Um, you partition your lattice into different domains, which can or cannot be overlapping. It's up to you. And you solve each of these domains independently of each other. Uh, if you solve each of these domains independently of each other simultaneously, it's an additive method. If you, if you do apply a coloring, uh, a coloring strategy so that you, um, you it's like block guys, uh, if you apply a coloring strategy, you can use a block gauss seidel like algorithm, so a multiplicative algorithm where you update subsets. Um, and uh, this, so this effectively kills the internode communication during these block solves. Um, so the easiest thing to do is just to use non-overlapping blocks and switch off the internode communication. Uh, and that was the first thing we did, because it was ridiculously easy. It required about two lines of code. Um, and so you, you have a, an iterative solver for solving the local system. Um, the, the, the global sums now are just local sums in that solver, so you don't need to do a global sum over the entire machine. Um, so pictorially, what you're doing here so we got a picture of the Wilson operator here. 
So we've got a diagonal term and eight off, eight off diagonals for the four dimensions times two directions. Um, and what you're effectively doing is when you're doing um, additive swarts is just zeroing out um, some of these off diagonal blocks here. So if, if we say that these green boxes here are located on a given processor, all additive swarts is doing is setting all these black terms here, these black off diagonals, to zero and ignoring those and doing a local solve here. So this is good for high frequency modes. Um, as mentioned yesterday, you're imposing a lambda cutoff effectively. Um, the precision of this thing, or the, the relevance, the original operator is only very approximate. So you can use very low precision here. So 16-bit precision is fine. 8-bit, it, it might even be fine. Um, there's a limit on scalability of the algorithm, of course, because as your blocks get smaller and smaller, it's going to become a less good preconditioner. Uh, in practice, other things kill you before you get that far. Um, the non-preconditioned part, if you're doing like 10 iterations of the local solver, and you still have to do like the full solver outside of that, and that becomes the Amdahl's law part, is having to do the occasional um, correction. Um, and so that seems to kill you before the preconditioner breaking down. Um, so if you put this on the GPU, you see that you get better strong scaling. Um, so this is you know, the speed up relative to the ICG stab uh, on the GPU and the CPU. And you can see that things get much better, but then you still, you know, things do crap out eventually. Um, and balance, take some results from Balan on running on many nodes of Titan. So these are the regular algorithms by CG stab, and these are additive shorts preconditioned. So you can see that the, the performance goes right up. Um, so CUDA supports, I don't have results to show for these, but CUDA supports multiplicative and additive shorts and overlapping blocks or non-overlapping non blocks. Um, the non-overlapping blocks are interesting. We, when it was first implemented, the motivation there was to think about staggered, because for staggered, improved staggered, you have an operator which stretches further across the lattice. And regular additive shorts didn't work well. And so uh, the, we figured we need, we need to extend the size of our blocks because our operator is bigger as well. And so when we first implemented overlapping blocks, um, we actually found numerical instabilities. And, and sometimes uh, GC, the, ultra GCR pre, the ultra GCR algorithm would just completely break down. And we worked out was because when we were doing overlapping blocks, we were doing a Swiss cross. We weren't getting the corners. So you do the exchanging the faces, but you need to remember the corners. And if you don't, if you forget the corners, you get exact zero modes popping up in your matrix, which is bad news. But you know, we worked that out after a week or so. Um, but it was very puzzling to begin with. Um, okay, so. Uh, switching to think about more optimal algorithms. So CUDA now has ICG, it has a Lanchos solver in there as well, but I won't talk about that. Um, so this was implemented by Alexis Chalchenko. Uh, so here's ICG just by, uh, as introduced by, um, uh, I'll call it the Greek contingent, uh, uh, Kostas and Andreas. Uh, so to implement this in the GPU, you need a lot of lap pack functionality. Um, so we use the Magma library for this. Memory's not a problem, so we can use the CPU as just a big cache for storing all the eigenvectors after we've, after we've computed them. Um, naively, you might think, because you need a huge set of eigenvectors, you're going to run out of memory because you're a bit more memory constrained in GPU. But once you've found a set of eigenvectors, you can just cache them in the CPU. You never need them again, except for um, uh, doing a projection at the beginning of the CG. Um, so we've got a nice framework, so we can add in new solvers, so I'd buy CG or GMRES DR, et cetera. Lanchos is in there as well. Um, on the right here, and this is just a plot showing, uh, as for all the different eigenvectors we've got here, Ritz vectors we've got here, we're just showing that ICG actually gets very noisy eigenvectors, very poor um, accuracy. A apart from the first few, you can see the accuracy just gets worse and worse. We've got the residual here. Um, not that it matters. Um, but you know, we see we've, we've only got finite precision on the eigenvectors. And so when you, do in, when you then solve what you find, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, so running ICG, you, you grab a, a bunch of vectors, um, and then you, then you rerun ICG again, you grab a new set of vectors where you're orthogonalizing each time as you go through the process. And you're re orthogonalizing on the eigenvectors that you discovered in the previous iteration. So your solver just gets faster and faster as you augment your collection of eigenvectors and more and more vectors. Um, and, and so we've got, you know, start off, you know, and we get like 2,000 iterations on this problem here. And we add more and more eigenvectors, and the number of iterations goes down and down and down. Um, and then and a critical part of ICG is because 
there's significant errors in the eigenvectors, it's important to do restarts um, in the solver. Otherwise, you'll get you'll remain with you keep your critical slowing down here. So since we only know the eigenvectors here to 10 to the minus 8, it's best to do a restart um, before you get to that point. They 10 to the minus 7, and you can maintain the linear convergence. Um, so this is just kind of observing what everyone's uh, done, if, observing what other people have seen before, but it's, it's all there. Um, now, eigenvector deflation is an interesting effect on uh, mixed precision CG. So we saw that the, the CG was very intolerant of um, mixed precision. Um, and so we did some steps to correct it. But I, I, using eigenvector deflation also fixes um, mixed precision um, uh, solvers as well. And it's, it's quite easy to see why that is. So if you take a precision truncated residual, it just completely misses the low modes of the operator. Um, because A times a low mode just ends up underflowing and you'll represent it. Um, so this, the fact that you, you miss out these low modes causes the breakdown in the CG recurrence relation. Um, now we can fix this, um, so we can fix it by using the reliable updates and all the, the things I talked about earlier, but that problem could still potentially be there. Um, if you project out the low modes, those low modes aren't there to be truncated anymore when you go to low precision. Um, so what you find is if you deflate CG, it becomes much more stable. And so, so if I take some performance numbers here, um, we started off, uh, so we're in twisted, twisted mass fermions here. It's fairly light. Um, so non-deflated double single solver took 15 seconds. Um, and the double half solver does not converge. Now, these numbers don't have the improved solver that I described a few slides ago. Um, uh, so this may converge nowadays. I we need to check that. Um, but then if you add deflation in there, so the performance uh, after you've got all the eigenvectors, so just doing init CG, so projecting the initial residual and then solving, the performance goes down to 2.4 seconds. And now double half converges because you've removed the low modes, which caused the instability in the solver. Um, and so you get a nice, com by using a better algorithm, you can use lower precision. So you get a multiplicative speed up there, which is quite cool. Sure. Sure, okay, so I, I met, forgot to mention that at the top here. So ICG itself, you need to, at the moment, we haven't worked out to do that in, double, in mixed precision. So we have to run the, the, the initialization of calculating eigenvectors in pure double precision. Um, there, the, so the first pass of ICG is the most expensive when you start with no eigenvectors. It was about 30 seconds. And then as you add more and more vectors, it just gets less. So 30 goes down to 28, 27, 26. As you add more vectors, and it takes less iterations. So I think it... So it's you know 30 seconds plus the sum of all the smaller pieces. Um, so there's initial cost there, of course. Just with any eigenvector solver algorithm, you've got to find your eigenvectors first of all. So this is a multi-right-hand side problem. But you're looking about say to get the full eigenvector set here, it's about 150 seconds, maybe 200 seconds. And then your final solver is this. So, so there's a break-even point, depending on how many solves you do, obviously. We are thinking about how to do mixed precision ICG, but it's we haven't worked that out yet. Um, and so here we're looking at double single versus double half, and you can see that um, the convergence history is almost identical between the two here. Um, so the blue lines should be identical because they're both running ICG in double precision, but the red line here um, is double single and double half. Um, okay. Now getting to multigrid. So, uh, uh, you know, the eigenvectors are great, but, you know, it will not have good scaling with volume as we, uh, a lot of people in the room are aware you want a, a more optimal solver that scales linearly, not quadratically with the volume. Um, so, uh, we have, we're wanting to implement adaptive geometric multigrid, um, as was described yesterday. Um, so you want to adaptively find the null space components as opposed to finding exact eigenvectors. And you have the self-learning algorithm, which I, I won't go into details here, but okay. since we talked about it this yesterday. And, and James showed a plot like this where you, where as you, so you need to find null space components. And so as you find one null space component and construct a course operator, which you can use as a constructive e-cycle with, um, you end up with a, a, you end up with a better preconditioner. So you started off where 
the original solver or relaxation where you, you are slow to conversion, so you add a vector and you find it gets better, another one is better and better. So um, we want to take adaptive multigrid and stick it on the GPU. It has perfect linear scaling, um, or very near to it, and that's demonstrated in this plot here, um, where we're taking, comparing regular CG um, on three different volumes of constant physics. Um, as we increase the volume, the number of Dirac operator applications in the CG solver increases. Um, with IGCG, although the critical slowing down is gone, um, the, num the number of iterations increases um, as we increase the volume. Um, so to keep this on top of this, you would have to add more eigenvectors. Um, whereas with multigrid, three different volumes, they all lie on top of each other at constant physics. Critical slowing down is gone. So we want this in the GPU. That's Wilson, yeah, yeah. That's an, an isotropic two-flavor Wilson from JLab circa 2008 or something, or before that. Um, and, I mean, this is really important, actually, um, to have the best, uh, to, to have, it's, it's all great having, the, having a really fast architecture, a highly tuned naive solver, but then if you just take a better algorithm, you can be a, a highly tuned implementation of a naive algorithm. Um, and so this is like about this is something that Balan has been reinforcing to me recently. That if you take a CUDA solver, compare it to mul on, on the GPU. So this is just a naive like solver, effectively, where naive here includes domain decomposition. Um, compare that to multigrid running in the CPU, and the CPU now beats the GPU. So we want multiplicative improvement of architecture and uh, algorithm. Uh, and in fact, actually, I think the oh, it's by CG style, is it? Um, so, uh, okay, so why, why is multigrid challenging in the GPU? Um, why is it? Um, so GPU requirements are very different than CPU. CPU is a very low latency um, architecture, and it doesn't mind running on small problems. GPU, as I said, you want tens of thousands of threads. As you go to coarser and coarser grids here, you have less and less threads available. Um, well, the extreme here, you would have uh, somewhat more cores than you would have um, degrees of freedom in your problem, so it wouldn't burn very well. Um, although I don't suppose anyone's suggesting running a one to the four lattice. Um, so the fine grids are going to burn very efficiently in this, on the GPU because that's the original problem that we know runs well. Coarse grids, especially as we get really coarse, are the worst possible scenario for running on a GPU. Um, you have, as, as you go from fine to coarse, I think of this as being a throughput bandwidth bound problem to a latency bound problem. Um, it's not just a case of you have more cores than you have degrees of freedom. You need to have many threads to saturate the memory bandwidth. There's a, there's a thing called Little's Law, where depend, the, the, given how much latency you have to access memory, you need to, act, uh, you need to transfer a minimum number of bytes to get, to get a certain number of bandwidth. So if you've, got a, if, you've got, if you've got a fixed latency and you know the bandwidth available in the architecture, there's a number of bytes that you need to be able to transfer to saturate that. And so as you go to the course degrees of freedom, you're going to have many less bytes transferred um, than, you, than you need to saturate the memory bandwidth. So this is going to be the Amdahl's all limiter. Um, but as I said, multigrid just decom um, decomposes this problem into throughput and latency. And so you have a throughput processor for doing the fine grids, and you have a, a latency processor, a CPU, for doing the coarse grids. And you can imagine having an arbitrary cutoff here um, when you want to do something in the CPU and when you want to do something in the GPU. Um, so what do you need to implement parallel um, adaptive multigrid? Um, well, you need all the things we've been talking about over the last day, so prolongation, smoothing, um, restriction. Oh, you need to do the setup, of course, as well, um, the course operator construction, as well as the actual course grid solver. Um, so the setup process itself requires um, local QR orthogonalization, so block orthogonalization of the null space vectors. Um, and so to get high performance there, you need to sort these, the original null space vectors, which are stored on a, like a global lattice order. You want to sort them into local block order, do a QR decomposition there, and then uh, transfer back to the original order. And, but that's a simple parallel process, no problem there at all. Um, it's just like a batch QR decomposition. Smoothing, that's, you're just going to be using the things you had before in the regular naive solvers, whether it's DD or a regular um, GM res or whatever um, solver you had, you're just repurposing the D slash you implemented before. Um, prolongation, 
So your interpolation from the coarse grids to the fine grids. Um, this is a one-to-many mapping, and it's easy to paralyze over the fine degrees of freedom here. Typically, you always want to, to paralyze over the fine degrees of freedom, not the coarse degrees of freedom, because then you have more parallelism, um, which the GPU likes. Restriction is a little bit more of a pain, though, because if you're going from a fine grid to a coarse grid, so this is a many-to-one mapping. So if you paralyze over the, over the many here, you're going to have a race condition where different threads could be writing to the same site. Um, so the, the solution here is actually quite simple. In the GPU, you, can, you just have to you, you use, um, you do local um, reductions, effectively, on each of the processors, which, is, which makes the problem very easy to paralyze over the fine grid. Um, course operator construction, so evaluating this RAP guy locally. So that's just batched matrix matrix products. Um, it's, again, it's something you should run very well because it's high numerical intent, high arithmetic intensity. Um, and it's, it's parallel, um, so it's, it's great. Uh, course grid solver, uh, whether this goes in the GPU or the CPU, you're going to want, a, you, you may want a direct solve depending um, how, or a, a direct solve depending on how, how coarse you go and, and how big a machine you're running on and if it's running the GPU or the CPU. But effectively, you could just repurpose the solvers you had on there originally. That's the first. Um, so when designing this, um, the, there's a th number of goals that comes to mind. Of course, we want performance. Um, QCD codes always like to reach high percentage of peak. Um, and as we showed, the brute force, uh, uh, brute force, I mean, so actually, this is counter to what I just showed. So we, I, I showed that the better algorithm can beat a brute force implementation. But it's not, always the, it's not always the case. You really want both coming together. You want the high performance code and the high performance algorithm. Flexibility, we want to be able to take an arbitrary cutoff and say, I want to run this many number of grids on the GPU and this number of grids on the, on the CPU and make this a completely runtime decision. So maybe even auto-tune which, which, where you put this cutoff. So you're, you, where you want to put that cutoff may vary depending on how far you strong scale. It may vary on how many GPUs you've got on a node, if you've only got a little ARM processor for CPU, etc. We want to provide optimal solvers for legacy applications, so you know, Chroma, CPS, et cetera. In long term, think about this just as a toolbox to explore algorithms. Um, so the, the way this is implementing CUDA is, is all straightforward. We, uh, CUDA is abstracted, so you can write the algorithms using generic fields, which is independent of whether it's running on um, the, the CPU or the, the GPU. Um, so the algorithms are written here um, at the high level. And then implementations are, are low level and abstracted away from all that. Um, so you know, writing the, the writing the algorithms is trivial. I mean, it's it's just um, just like you would write anywhere else. Um, where you this is just the implementation of the V cycle at a given level. If I'm on the if I'm, if I'm not on the coarse grid, on the coarsest grid, then just do the usual thing of pre-smooth restrict, um, uh, solve, um, prolongate, and post-smooth. Oops. And then, or if I'm on the course, I'll do a course solve. Very straightforward. Um, so I've driven, I've, I've got a picture here of what the course operator looks like. And I, I draw with many, many little lines here you can't probably quite make out here. Because on the course grid, when you have to take a bunch of null space vectors, all those vectors effectively become the dimension of the link matrices which connect the degrees of freedom on the course grid. And so you can work out what this thing looks like on the course grid, and you end up with something here. It looks kind of like a Dirac operator. What you actually have is these link matrices here, which are dense. So in the original operator, where we had a tensor product between color and spin, now this is just a dense matrix where it, the, there's, no, there's no tensor product there at all. Um, uh, so uh, we talked about where to, where to, where to paralyze. Um, OK, so parallel, you know, but you can break, break down parallel multigrid into simple parallel primitives. And so we use a nice library called Cub for doing like these things like local reductions for doing for, for, um, for doing restriction and things like that. But it's, it's all fairly straightforward. Um, now, if we've got this running the GPU, running the CPU, we want to write the same code once. Not the algorithm, but the actual implementation of the code, all these nasty matrix vector products which appear in here. And you only want to write that once. You don't want to write it for all the different architectures you're running on, so GPU and CPU. So we use C++ templates to abstract away all the arch specifics. So that's like the field order, because the GPU likes a different field order than the CPU, um, typically. Um, any machine-specific um, machine, um, intrinsics, such as cache modifiers. Um, you want to abstract away precision, because you obviously don't want to 
and write the same code for all different precisions. Um, so CPU and GPU code are almost identical. And the only difference is essentially can be boiled down into like a couple of things. Um, I'll just show the example here. So in the bottom left here, I've got a CPU function. So I've taken an argument, uh, uh, an argument struct, which just has all the parameters in there. And the CPU code is going to do a for loop over the sites of the lattice, perhaps parallelized with OpenMP, and then call a function called bar. So this is foo calling bar. So bar is where all the code is written. This is you know all the algorithms in here. Um, and this is. Uh, so the only difference between GPU and CPU is now in the GPU code, instead of having a for loop here, I've just got a thread index. So for every site on the lattice where I was doing a for loop before, I now just take a thread index. And now I call the same function um, where before I just called the index in the loop. Now I just give it a thread ID, and I do this, the, same, it's the same piece of code here. So 99% of the code is here. 1% of the code is just instantiating a template for GPU or instantiating a template um, for CPU or GPU. And so all the platform-specific stuff can be in here, whether it's OpenMP, whether it's um, um, doing GP, GPU threads, whether it's doing um, vectorization could be in there for, for CPU. Um, here I'm doing a, a local reduction here because of because I'm, it's something like, and this is what we kind of do in a restriction operator. But this is the way to write code. So it only runs, it runs anywhere you want it. So it, it, running a new architecture is just a case of instantiating a template, which most people can do. Um, now, there is a compilation problem here. Uh, if you were to write these adaptive algorithms naively, um, so in the setup process, you don't know a priori how many vectors you're going to need to solve your, your system. At least, you, 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 will, you have an idea of using these algorithms for a while. But you know, the classic adaptive multigrid algorithms, you don't know how many degrees of freedom you, know, you need in the course grid. And so the, the traditional serial setup process is where you find one null space vector, test it, set up the whole V cycle setup, to grab another one, grab another one, go through all those degrees of freedom. So you need to test the create a uh, course grid with you know one degree of freedom, two, three, four, five. Um, so these um, degrees of freedom correspond to four local for loops per thread on in GPU code or CPU code as well. Now if you have a for loop. Um, if you do not know the length of the loop, then the compiler cannot unroll it. And if it cannot unroll it, then it will spill all those variables out of registers and into cache. Because um, the, the um, registers are not indexable at, at runtime. You've got to be able to do all your in, resolve all your indexing at compile time. So if you can't do that, if you don't know the size of these um, loop counts at compile time, this will give horrible performance. It doesn't the CPU, it's not just a GPU problem. It, the GPU ex, uh, extensifies it because the GPU's got less cache than a CPU per thread. So you need to know all these, these components at compile time. So what you if you have to template over all the different colors and spins you need to do, um, so you say you've got, you want to be able to do up to 30 course, course degrees of freedom. Um, you want to do all the different precisions. Um, you want to deal with all the different or field orderings. You've got all the different kernels, whether it's prolongation, course operator construction, et cetera, et cetera. You can end up with um, 10,000 combinations per kernel you need to do at compile time. That's, in that, that's kind of like compile and then come back next week. It's not just go for a coffee break. Um, so this is a major problem to implementing the fully adaptive algorithm in the GPU. Um, JIT compilation fixes this, where you just compile the thing you need on the fly. That's that's not quite available in, on GPU programming yet, but it will be at the end of the year. But it's, um, so this is, this is one of the big things holding back from the fully adaptive algorithm. And so our code at the moment, um, we're just baking this in because we're just taking vectors. You know, we know how many vectors we need. Um, so this, will, this, this, this is a real problem that, that will be fixed with JIT compilation. So JIT compilation is just just-in-time compilation where you just compile the, the, the kernel that you need on the fly as you get it. Um, okay, so when you put it all together, you know, the framework's working. It's not very fast at the moment because there's too much debugging code in there, and Michael and I are still um, working on it. So this is all the work on the adaptive multigrid is a combination between Michael in the back up there, Rich and myself. Um, so uh, it's all working, the algorithm's fine. There's just, it needs more optimization. But if you take the, like, standard GCR algorithm, which is with a simple MRP conditioner, so it's just like a... Uh, or this, yeah, simple MR preconditioner, which also functions as a smoother, add in a course grid correction, you can see the difference in convergence here. 
Now, when you run on the GPU, how much time have I got? I'll take 10. Um, when you're on the GPU, you're not using the CPU. So sometimes when you buy a GPU processor, a GPU ser server, you've got this really big CPU, which constitutes a large fraction of compute, and you might not be using it very much. Um, and it'd be nice if you could use it. Now, traditional Krilov solver algorithms are, are, are homogeneous, and you, can, you, could, you could try and split apart that problem off and stick it on the, on the CPU and on both CPU and GPU at the same time. But it's kind of nasty, because that would, um, it, it, um, you're going to have some asymmetric splitting of your lattice size locally, and that would just be a nightmare of trying to program, and program that on a, a massively parallel machine. On multigrid, you know, we have the separation of scales, and so we think, oh, maybe we can put a bit on the GPU and a bit in the CPU at the same time and have both processors utilized at the same time. Um, naively, because this is serial, like multiplicative, you, you, um, you can't do these both at the same time. If you switch to an additive process, so a la, like, like Lucia's algorithm, as we were talking about yesterday, um, you can, in principle, utilize both the GPU and the CPU at the same time for operating on, on grids independently from each other. Now, as was pointed out, um, if you switch to additive methods, the coarse grid solution, you need a, you need a more accurate coarse grid solution. And, and because of that, it makes it un, um, not possible to do multi-level, unless you have exact coarse solves at each level. Um, but we're not talking about multi-level additive here. All we're talking about is doing additive at one level, at one interface. So multiplicative, say, between if you've got three-level algorithm, you might have levels one and two on the GPU, multiplicative, but additive for between two and three between GPU and CPU. So those two guys can run at the same time. And, you know, an accurate course, even if, you know, you did need to go accurate um, on the course grid, um, if, this is, if these are just cycles you're getting for free because you're able to utilize your CPU while your GPU is working, an accurate course grid solution might be no cost anyway because it's coming for free because you're just using cycles that were otherwise not being used. So um, that's what I think, in a nutshell, what the best um, GPU, eh, heterogeneous algorithm will look like on these architectures. And I think that's what's going to make the combination of uh, the wide GPU and the narrow CPU the best for getting good scaling on multigrid. The ability to decompose the problem and work on both these things at the same time. Because um, you, this, this, you do not have the usual disadvantages of an additive method here. OK. So just to close up, I'll think about future directions. Um, so this is a, a typical slide people like to show it in video. I always like to have a nice roadmap showing what, what's the name of the physicist down the road and the next physicist after that. Because we name our GPUs after physicists. It's not just physicists, actually. It's physicists that have units named after them. So that narrows the scope. You have to have a unit named after you, otherwise you don't. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, that would actually be a good one. Um, so even before like GPUs became programmable, even when they were like fixed function and just used in games and nothing else, there was Celsius and Fahrenheit over here. These, these names are not known in this public. But there's a whole catalog, and there's Volta comes after Pascal. Um, oh, it's not, not quite units, but I've invented a unit. as more precise, sorry. Um, OK, so 2016 is when Pascal comes. We're in Maxwell at the moment. Um, there'll be big Maxwell cards out in a few months. Um, but the big thing to look forward to is Pascal. Um, so this is going to have two new technologies, which is going, which is going to be really interesting for QCD algorithms. So NVLink um, is a fast interconnect between GPU and CPU, and between GPU and GPU. So at the moment, when two GPUs speak to each other, or when a GPU and a CPU speak to each other, you have to go through PCI Express, which is order 10 gigabytes per second, much slower than the memory bandwidth, um, local memory bandwidth access. So NVLink is a new high-speed interconnect, which um, uh, replaces PCI Express. Um, so the first iteration will be between about 80 to 100 gigabytes per second. You'll be able to speak to the CPU or, or to your neighboring GPUs. Um, and there's the first CPU that's going to support this is Power, so IBM's power processors. They're building their power processors with NVLink built in. Other architectures, it's not going to come to Intel architectures anytime soon, but um, the other architecture where this would come would be ARM. But the first architecture would be Power. So with ARM, you would have like a very small CPU. Um, and like connects to the GPU. The power processor is the opposite of the ARM processor. It's the biggest, fastest serial processor known to mankind kind of thing. Faster than Xeons, but you know, expensive and very power hungry. So that kind of gets eats both ends of the market. So I think probably for QCD, ARM might be more, more interesting, but power will come first. So this is 2016. Um, 
other thing that's coming is stacked memory. So four times higher bandwidth than you have available today. So up to a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth per processor. And like GPU, or D slash at the moment, is, is all memory bandwidth bound. So you make your memory bandwidth four times faster, D slash gets four times faster. Um, uh, so stacked memory is where instead of having uh, separate memory on the card, you now get a single package with the memory mounted on the same, um, same package as the GPU itself. So the memory is much closer to the GPU. You can run many more traces between the memory and the chip because they're much closer. So you can have much larger capacity, much more bandwidth, and it's much more energy efficient because the traces are much shorter. So this is what a GPU looked like in 2016. Right? So a GPU and a CPU speaking to each other where the GPU can speak to the CPU just as fast as the CPU can speak to its own memory. Um, and so if, you know, if the GPU can speak to the CPU at the same speed it can speak to its own memory, there's no bottleneck between GPU and CPU anymore. And then you have this very fast memory bandwidth here to the local access here. Um, now just thinking about going like, much further forward in the future of GPUs. So GPUs have got much faster, but exponential growth. And this has been driven by the million dollar, multi-billion multi dollar gaming market, bigger than the Hollywood. Um, is this going to come to an end anytime soon? We saw from 1993 to 2013 the evolution in graphics. Um, uh, how much further is there to go yet? Well, this is like a scrap screenshot from the, a current game. Um, um, and it looks good, but it doesn't look as good as this, which is a ray traced image. Like, it's very close to being photorealistic. Now, the difference between going from here to there, um, you know, if, if once you have interactive games that are photorealistic like this, that's the end goal for graphics. There's an image here which is also a ray traced image. Um, so each photorealistic image, so like one of these, takes around two seconds to render on a GPU now. Whereas a screenshot like this with all these like complicated physics effects and uh, the, the flames and smoke and things like that going in there, they have to come at like, uh, 100 every second, 100 frames per second. So you need to go, to get to photorealistic imagery, you need at least GPUs to be 200x faster than they are today. Um, and so that is, you know, at least GPUs have got that much growth left on them as being driven by the gaming market, which is what subsidizes high performance computing for GPUs. Um, and then you add on like all the physics simulations, which are actually now games that have now include things like rigid body mechanics simulations, uh, CFD simulations for doing smoke, water, wind, etc. hair simulations. Um, so actually this 200x is a very uh, lower bound estimate on how to get where you need for photorealistic imagery. That's just for like a non-interactive um, animation um, being rendered. When you add on all these physics effects, this 200x actually goes up to something like 500x improvement required over today's GPUs, subsidized by the billion dollar gaming market. So that's good news for GPU computing. Um, these GPUs are getting faster and faster, um, but an important thing is, of course, the algorithms. Um, so this is a nice plot I'd like to show that uh, Carl Janssen came up with. Um, and it's showing, um, over um, year by year, the, the cost of generating a lattice, some trajectory. I can't remember the parameters. I have them written down somewhere. Um, so the, the, the time in days to do like an HMC generation um, and as you evolve in years, you get faster and faster supercomputers, so the cost comes down. But what actually happens is that the algorithms get better and better as well. So you have this multiplicative improvement of, uh, of machine and algorithm, and the actual cost comes down much faster than this. Um, and so as we get to these new architectures, the algorithms, I think, will be just as important. Um, I'll probably just skip over this for time. Um, so. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it quickly. Um, so an, an example of really thinking about how to put the problem in the architecture becomes important. So, I mean, if you just think about uh, naively putting a, a D slash operator on, um, on the GPU or on the CPU, um, it naively just scales with memory bandwidth. And memory bandwidth, modular one-time changes like stat memory, doesn't, um, doesn't go exponentially. There's no Moore's law for memory bandwidth. So you really have to think about how to maximally use the locality of the problem. So in the blue plot here, we've got the performance, um, like illustrative performance of what a D slash would look like just as we jump forward in generation of GPU if the problem was me memory bandwidth bound. The green here um, is what the performance is if you actually utilize all the locality of the problem, such as um, making sure that neighboring, when you do like a D slash operation, you don't repeatedly load a given spinner index by two neighboring um, updates, or you, use the lo you load the gauge field in once and keep it in cache and use it for multiple D slash operations. So utilizing all the locality of the problem, 
is, is going to be critical, um, become more and more critical, or inventing algorithms that, be in, that use more and more of the locality um, as architectures become um, taller and wider and less, um, not, more memory bandwidth found in, in a nutshell. Um, so an example of algorithms um, to increase locality are doing things like um, uh, instead of if you've got a bunch of um, linear systems to solve, you should um, solve them rather than solve them in series. You should solve them in the same go in the same in the, uh, solve them simultaneously to turn a problem which is more memory bandwidth bound into cache bound. So try it, come up with algorithms that increase locality. So an example here. Sure. Doesn't that thing go against you trying to do IT? So yeah, I didn't say ICG was the, sol the solution to anything. Uh, okay. I'm saying you know there's a future direction to think about. Right. And so yeah, I don't have all the answers. Um, so here's an example though. I mean, if you look at staggered staggered day slash, it's very memory bandwidth bound, more so than Wilson. Um, so if you just apply the d slash to one right hand side, um, this is like from a GPU a couple of years ago, you get maybe 180 gigaflops. But then if you gang all your vectors into one and then reuse the loading of the gauge field, you can see the performance just increases, increases, it eventually plateaus because it comes, this point is gauge, it's, it's cache bound as opposed to um, memory bandwidth bound. Um, but you can see there's a huge performance uplift from switching to, to multiple right-hand sides. And so we just created locality there. And, and so you want algorithms that create loca locality. Um, we only just scratched the surface of the domain decomposition. So I said that we, we have additive shorts. We just switch off the communication. We have overlap, overlapping and multiplicative, but we haven't really exercised them um, in anger yet. But there's all kinds of variations you can do um, thinking about how to reduce communication between when, when doing linear solves. Um, some of them are well, well, well grounded, and some of them are quite random, like, um, uh, like precision truncation. Um, you could imagine. I think of you have classical Schwartz algorithms here, so additive Schwartz, multiplicative Schwartz, and you've got regular homogeneous Krylov solvers here. Um, and so there's all different ways to interpolate from one to the other. So you could start truncating the precision that you do communication. When you truncate to nothing, then you end up with Schwartz. When you end up with no truncation, you start with the original solver. So interpolating between these two things looks um, seems like a logical thing to do when exploring a more um, uh, scalable solvers are only communicating in alternating directions, things like that. A lessons idea from outside of regular PD solvers and things like that. Um, so there's all, this is there's a huge spectrum to explore there. Um, so that was more communication latency. I, as I've talked about this already, you know, global sums are bad. Um, not just the synchronizations, but it leads to performance fluctuations as well because you you become more readily influenceable by either users on your supercomputer at the same time. Um, so when you do a global sum, you've got whole machine network traffic, and it could be influenced. Anyone who uses a crane machine knows that your performance can fluctuate a lot depending on what other user is nearby you in that machine. Um, so you want you know, S-step algorithms. Um, uh, one thing that's coming in CUDA now, we've uh, got one-sided communication. Um, so the idea of when you're doing me exchanging messages that you don't participate, that classical MPI requires you to um, do a handshake when you do the actual message. So you, you, you exchange a message between sender and receiver, and the two, the two actually have to participate in that all the time, and it adds extra latency. One-sided communication is when you do the handshaking up front, and you have, effectively, you have the ability to push or, or gather and without the other guy taking part. So that reduces latency. Um, and one-sided communication has also been thought about, I've seen in a couple of, couple of, um, couple of works, thinking about um, Asynchronous solver algorithms. This gives you the ability to have an asynchronous solver um, if if you don't need your the the destination or the receiver to take part in the exchange. So I think that'll be an interesting to talk about. Um, so I just really think of CUDA now as this hierarchical algorithm toolbox where you can explore all these things. Um, so other things to think about are like the coupling of precision and algorithm. Um, so CUDA allows you to to specify the precision of a field at any point in the algorithm. Um, you know, it currently supports double, single, and half precision. But you know, as we get algorithms which are more and more stable to low precision, we start to think, oh, is 8-bit precision an interesting thing to think about? Um, or going the other way, when we're, we're talking about the limits of how much the residual can resolve and how far, um, how far can you run your linear solver for so you get good acceptance in your HMC, do we have to go to higher precision? Well, the solution, I think, was probably to go to a better preconditioner. Um, but this is an interesting thing to keep an eye on. When the number of degrees of freedom um, 
uh, get so big in your problem that you cannot um, you cannot actually do a global sum over the entire problem. Uh, uh, that you may think you're in trouble then. Uh, you know, and, and you know this is talked about in Matthias's talk, but the combination between domain decomposition and multigrid this isn't really been explored in Anger yet. So DD solvers are good for you know high frequency dampening, which we all know. Um, but you know when you add in other uh, other twiddleable parameters here, such as overlapping domains, as we go to coarser and coarser degrees of freedom, our problems get too small to run well in parallel. And so at, at that point, the course you know scaling the coarse grid is going to become the most costly thing. And so I think um, focusing on you know things like overlapping domains or getting the best scaling course solver is going to be the uh, a key thing to think about. Okay, so uh, I gave you a quick introduction to Qt Library. It, you know all the classic solver algorithms, but most efforts now are on more optimal methods. Um, so DD eigenvectors, multigrid, mixed precision, etc. Um, Hopefully, we're putting together a nice toolbox which just allows us to explore all these things and uh, all these things together, um, where the aim is scalability and optimality, whereas the two usually um, do not go hand in hand. But that's the goal here. Um, and all these kind of algorithms we're playing on with here are kind of relevant for for um, you know exascale and beyond architectures. So some of the ideas that we explore now may not be relevant today, but they, they will may well be very relevant tomorrow. Thank you. understand this issue about um, why you might not be able to do a global sum uh, accurately enough. Uh, maybe if you're trying to do it in floating point, but can't you just do, I mean, there's a overhead associated with it to, you know, basically first, ra first uh, uh, you know, pass around, everybody passes around, uh, you know, something that the dynamic range that they need to do the, for the numbers that they have, and then you figure out what the global dynamic range needs to be, and then you do everything in fixed precision. Yes, that is the solution. Right. Yes. So that, that uh, I mean, even for the QCDSP, we had that implemented. So, I mean, I, but that, the QCDSP was more hard work. I mean, you can't do that. You wouldn't be able to do that without zero cost and a simple create at the moment. Uh, well, they, uh, I mean, the, these, I, mean, I don't I, know if they're implemented in hardware. Certainly, one could implement that. Oh, sure. I mean, I, 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 was, I was reading a paper a couple of days ago. Because in the end, it's integer arithmetic. It's yes, multi absolutely. arbitrary precision integer arithmetic that you're doing. Yes. So I, so I, I, you know, I completely agree that 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 having a better algorithm for doing a global sum is a good thing. Well, certainly, having it implemented in hardware would be nice rather than doing it in software. And, yeah. Okay. I was reading a paper a couple of days ago about how to do an exact floating point global sum, which is actually not that complicated to do. And so you and you get around the fact that it's not associative, and you get an exact global sum, um, which is not hard to implement on a CPU or a GPU. So hopefully, I'll get that in QDA soon. So it's a funky multi-level algorithm which does multiple levels of Cahan summation, and then uses uh, a big integer accumulator for anything that spills over out into there, and then it does this like five-level hierarchical algorithm, which might sound horrible, but um, it's it, it makes sense. And what you end up with at the end of the day is the exact you, you get the exact you get the exact floating point result. You get the exact result truncated. You know, you get the sorry, start that again. You get the exact result rounded to your desired precision. With no error, and it's fully reproducible, fully associative result. So it's the exact result truncated, rounded to the, the final desired position. Is 
Well, at the moment, at the moment, no. I mean, so we have a, like all the physics. We have a physics library which is called PhysX, um, uh, and so that does things like rigid bodies and, and 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 CFD and things like that. But because the graphics, you know, are not photorealistic, they they don't they, they you know they use every trick in the book just to get good enough. And so it's well different. You know, it's very different. It's a different regime to be in than, you know, actual simulations. Um, but the drive to actually have photorealistic or improved images actually drives up the need for better physics simulations as well at the same time. So there have been this. The, yeah, in principle, in principle. I mean, the triangulation stuff's done in hardware. So I just, when I was watching some of your talk today, I actually thought, I wonder if some of you could use some of the graphics APIs for doing some scraping some of that. Because then we could take another question if there are ones. Because I was only worried about the lunch um, barrack. Any other questions? Um. Also, I don't know if Sarah Gay is here for a comment. Oh, by the way, uh, talking about your, your, your IBM connection, uh, uh, Jim Sexton is going to come to this meeting at the end of summer. Uh, and I talked to him, and he said, it's really exciting. We're doing lots of exciting things. I can't tell you about them. And I said, is this involved in video? Yes, I can't tell you anything about it. So, <laughs> so obviously, there's a lot of enthusiasm by Jim Sexton. He was really anxious to come and uh, sort of take part in the uh, thing at the end of the summer. That's the thing that John Dodson said. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we've now got uh, I can, we have a, a person from Intel, but I don't think he's really that expert. But John Dodson and, and Jim Sexton will be interesting to have together. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's an old lat if people know who know who he is, he was a lattice gauge theorist who was very involved in the DG L P Q uh, stuff. So um, now he seems to be involved in the NVIDIA thing. I mean, he's not a designer, but he's a, a liaison in our community. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I guess we'll break for lunch. All right. All right. The last restart now.